Hello and welcome to the third in the series of the AI Spring um, sessions for the Doctoral Consortium. For those of you who don't know, the Doctoral Consortium is a platform that we've established at Digital Futures as a way of, sort of sharing knowledge, um, sharing knowledge around the world. We discovered when, back in the summer of the, of the pandemic that we could break through not just the, uh, the physical walls of the classroom, but also the social, economic and, and other barriers to bring uh, educational ideas to everyone. The Doctoral Consortium then is based on the idea it doesn't make so much sense anymore to be a small group of individuals taught by an individual professor in one particular classroom when we can have a global platform and uh, share ideas completely around the globe um, as a form of, glo of global brain, as it were. This one is hosted by FIU DDES, uh, the, the two-year program in Florida National University. Previously, we've also had sessions hosted by Tongji University in China, and we are we're very soon going to be having hosting these sessions with our, our different language uh, channels um, in Spanish, Portuguese, Farsi, and Arabic. Before I uh, introduce the session as such, let me just say make a few announcements um, about sessions to come in the future. Um, uh, very much related to today's session, we have a session um, next Saturday um, on Dali, Midjourney, um, and, um, and, and other platforms um, where we are introducing, we are, have invited a number of uh, young um, um, the designers to come and show their work. That's going to be a very action-packed session. I think we have a, about 10 or 12 presenters. And then uh, we're also putting out a call for a session on experimental 3D printing with custom materials on the 5th um, of November. Uh, the submissions are due by the 21st of October. So please um, look out for that on our website. So today's session um, is uh, going to be with Memo Acton. Um, it's part of a, um, the initial a series of, of uh, introducing the, the, the diffusion platforms and new techniques themselves and the impact that they're having. This follows on from the introductory sessions that I, I gave in the last two weeks. Next week, we look at the design studio. We bring in a number of people who've been teaching, um, uh, particularly mid-journey in the design, to see what impact it's going to have on it's having on the design studio. And then the week after that, we go to the uh, architectural office where we bring in Patrick Schumacher, Wan Yu Her, Daniel Bollinger, and Theodore Polanis to, to think about what the future of the architectural office will be in the age of AI. Um, then we have a break for Acadia and we go through a series of sessions looking at the books that have come out uh, this year. So the thesis behind the whole uh, series is the fact that the, this year is very much the year in which AI is having a huge impact on architecture for two particular reasons, for, for two reasons. One, the launch of these diffusion platforms. Um, and secondly, the books have all come out all this year. This is the year very much of AI. So you can see how these sessions are divided up. The third one's in blue, uh, good Iranian, Ukrainian colors here. The ones in blue um, are the ones about the platforms that, that have been established and the ones in yellow are looking at the, um, uh, at the question of the, of, of the books that have come out. Um, so to introduce Memo is, is quite a challenge. Um, Memo is one of the most uh, versatile all-rounders that I've come across. Um, uh, I think he probably would be best described as, as a polymath, um, trained as an engineer in Turkey. Um, he came to the UK where he established himself as an artist, uh, winning a number of, of quite significant prizes, including, including the, the uh, a prize for Ars Electronica, the Golden Nika Award. Um, and he established uh, Marshmallow Laser Feast, one of the um, one of the leading, uh, one of the pioneering pioneering firms in the field of interactive design. Following that, he then undertook a PhD uh, in at uh, Goldsmith College in London in the computer science department, and most recently he's come over to California, where I am right here, um, to become a professor at UC San Diego. What makes um, Memo unique then is this astonishingly versatile approach towards things. Um, in some ways, I think sometimes of, of the way that uh, uh, Alan Turing is, it could be described. He wasn't simply uh, a computer genius, someone who saw the future of AI, um, but also somebody who had an interest in neuroscience. Um, in in others, a number of other fields, he was well known for debating with Wittgenstein about the, the philosophy of mathematics and so on. And Memo too is somebody who kind of spans a number of different disciplines an extraordinary way. Um, he's somebody that infuses all his kind of work with a, a deep set of, of philosophical um, and, and uh, concerns about that in, in introducing the, the theme of religion and many other things. Whenever I hear um, a Memo, I'm always deeply fascinated by, by his work. This particular session in many ways kind of picks up on some of the themes that we were looking at in the last semester in the series AI Neuroscience and Consciousness, um, which was so extraordinarily successful and which you can find 
on our YouTube um, our YouTube channel um, to look at the theme of distributed consciousness. Whatever I say will not do justice to the extraordinary ideas that Memo has. So let me just simply hand over to him. Memo, it's a great, great uh, treat and honor to have you here today. Uh, thank you so much for, for coming to, to speak to us. So let me unshare my screen and uh, um, Memo, over to you. Uh, well, thank you so much for that incredibly kind uh, introduction, Neil. And thanks again for the invitation. Um, let me, it's a bit early, 7 a.m. So I'm just trying to, oh yeah, there it is, share. Okay. Um, okay. So, uh, yeah, thanks once again for the invite and for the kind words and for everybody um, who's on the line and watching. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Yeah, so the title of my talk is Distributed Consciousness. Um, and I'm not going to talk about any of my prior work, um, any of my previous work prior to last year. Um, you can find some older talks covering my previous works and thoughts at memo.tv slash talks. The title of my talk is Distributed Consciousness. Um, and that's the title of a project that I made and I released last year. And today, I only would like to talk about that one project and some more recent musings around creative AI that I think are going to be very connected to a lot of the themes that um, Neil was talking about. But first, to give you uh, an overview of the kind of work that I've been doing, I'd like to play and talk over a very short video showing a, a selection of all the work. So I'm an artist that works with code. And in my work, I try to bridge a number of different themes and inspirations, studying natural and anthropogenic processes centered around ecology and technology, spanning disciplines from mythology to contemporary technologies such as machine learning and artificial intelligence. The title of my talk, as I already mentioned, is Distributed Consciousness which was initially referring to this one project that I made and released last year. But in the year since that project was released, some really crazy things happened, as I'm sure you all know. First, Disco Diffusion came out, then Mid Journey, then DALI 2, and then just a few months ago, Stable Diffusion came out, and Stable Diffusion is open source. So hundreds, if not thousands of people around the world have started tinkering and they've got to working on various add-ons and mods so that we have now have plugins for Photoshop, for Blender, for 3D, for audio. On top of that, just this last week, we have multiple papers and demos on text to video, text to 3D, text to animation, text to audio. It's really been quite a crazy journey. And if you're not familiar with any of these things that I just mentioned, um, don't worry, I, I will explain them. Uh, but the impact of these things, I think are a lot more significant than we, than we realize. And this is what I want to talk about in the second half of my talk. And in fact, the title Distributed Consciousness, which was initially only referring to that one project I made last year, I feel is now more relevant than ever. I like to think of a cybernetic meadow where mammals and computers live together in mutually programming harmony. Like pure water touching clear sky. I like to think of a cybernetic forest filled with pines and electronics where days draw peacefully past computers as if they were flowers and spinning blossoms. I like to think of a sudden 
when I think calls you. When we are free of our labors. And joined back to nature. Return to our mammal, brothers and sisters. So that I made early last year, um, I think around June, July. At the time, things like disco diffusion, et cetera, didn't exist. And already, so that was text-based. Um, everything that you saw in that video was created from text prompts. And I'm going to spend the second half of this talk on that. Already that, the fact that that was possible was just blowing me away. Um, and so around that time, I was doing a lot of experimentation into this text-based imagery. And this other project that I want to talk about, Distributed Consciousness, was born. So this is a multifaceted work that spans themes of biological and artificial intelligence, distributed computation, distributed cognition, cryptography, evolution, phenomenology, ecological awareness, climate change, activism, and cephalopods. I'll first very briefly talk about what the project is and how the work manifested itself. And then I'll talk about the themes and the motivations behind the work. So the project began as an NFT collection on the ecologically friendly Tezos blockchain. This was a collection of 256, that's two to the power of eight, uh, unique cephalopod-like tentacular critters created with giant matrix multiplications, I mean, AI, machine learning. And so yeah, these are AI generated images created with custom software based on crip guided VQGAN, which was the kind of state of the art at the time. And there's exactly 256 of them. That's two to the power of eight, because octopuses have eight legs, obviously. And in October 2021, so pretty much exactly a year ago, I released them gradually, 16 at a time, every day for 16 days. And a month after this collection was released, I revealed the secret that actually this was phase one. And there was also going to be a phase two. And the secret was that every one of these 256 images that was spawned, i.e. released into the world, minted and sold, had in fact some text cryptographically encoded in it, a verse hidden amongst the pixels, invisible to the human eye, but readable by code. And the entire collection of images was in fact a poem, a book, a manifesto. And every image that had gone out of a tentacular critter was in fact one verse from the poem. It was one page from this manifesto. Furthermore, the entire text was also generated with AI using GPT-3. So the manifesto is a human machine co-creation meditation spanning themes of consciousness, free will, life, death, art, technology, ritual, ecology, economy, and sustainability. And as part of this secret reveal, I released each verse over the course of the following weeks as audiovisual readings. The entire manifesto can be read and listened to online. Um, here you can see this is the website for the project. On the left column, you can see all of the original tentacular critters that I released first um, that contain the cryptographically encoded and hidden text. And then next to them are the corresponding audiovisual readings of the verses that I released a month later with the text decoded and spoken. The whole thing is over an hour and a half long, um, but I've edited it down to 22 minutes for an installation version. And then at the end of this section, I'd like to play some short excerpts from that. But first I want to dig deeper into the motivations behind the work. 
And there's a few threads that I'd like to start with um, and then eventually connect. One, the spark. So I've been living in a small Mediterranean fishing village for the last few years um, in Turkey, and I'd go snorkeling almost daily. And I'd see octopuses very often, but usually they'd be at depths greater than three, four, five, six meters. And at that depth, the seawater filters some of the longer wavelengths of light and effectively reduces color. So the octopuses would always appear bluish green. One day I saw an octopus sitting on a rock just a few centimeters from the surface under the full spectrum of sunlight. It flashed at me the most intense colors and the vividness of the pink, green, purple, yellow, orange. It just completely blew my mind. And that was the spark that ignited the mess of highly flammable kindlings of ideas that were loosely floating around in my head at the time. And on a side note, um, it's worth parking this thought with regards to how ideas happen and how inspiration and sparks go together. I'll be revisiting this phenomena at the very end of my presentation. And in fact, I, I tweeted that at the time when, when I first saw it and started working on this project. Two, distributed computation. There is a lot to be said about the current developments around blockchains and the so-called Web3 phenomena, whether it's the VC-backed hyper-capitalist extreme libertarian values driving its growth or the ecological nightmare that is proof of work blockchains such as proof of work driving blockchains such as Bitcoin and until very recently Ethereum. But the point I'd like to focus on right now is a much more speculative one. I've been working within the fields that we call artificial intelligence for many, many years, and only in recent years has the term really exploded in popularity. This is the Google News trend graph for the phrase artificial intelligence, and you can see that it started exploding around 2015. And this is a trend graph for the phrase big data. You can see it practically didn't exist until around 2011. And I'm really fascinated by how <clears throat> after a steady period of big data, we get AI. I really like the provocation that consciousness is evolution's solution to dealing with big data in the natural world. Especially when vision evolved around half a billion years ago and brought with it the selective pressures to reward organisms that could utilize the limited bandwidth in their neural pathways more efficiently so that they could take more optimal actions while trying to catch prey or evade predators. And ultimately, as some believe, this may have even contributed to the evolutionary arms race we call the Cambrian explosion. And in more complex organisms, this may even include learning to model the environment to be more efficient and successful at processing even more complex sensory information and to be able to take more optimal and dare I say intelligent actions in an increasingly complex world. And going even further, to further improve chances of survival, some organisms may learn to model themselves as abstract entities with goals and needs and desires in an environment full of other abstract entities with goals and needs and desires. So I can interact with any of you and try to predict and understand your actions, not by simulating the activity of trillions of individual cells that constitute you, not by solving the wave function of your oscillations in cosmic quantum fields, but I can model you as a thinking, feeling individual, whereby your consciousness is an abstracted high-level entity with goals and needs and desires that I can empathize with. Your consciousness is my interface to you. So I really like this metaphor relating the emergence of AI as a means of coping with big data, analogous to the Darwinian evolution of intelligence and perhaps even consciousness as a means of dealing with big data in biology. And I wrote an article about this in 2014, my blog post, and actually two years later, Peter Gruffy Smith wrote a wonderful book called Other Minds exactly on this topic. And I'll get to that shortly actually. But now continuing this thread, 
I find the rise of blockchain-based distributed world computers quite fascinating. These are blockchains with smart contract support, such as Ethereum or Tezos, which allow the execution of arbitrary code in a distributed manner, where every node <clears throat> in such a network, <clears throat> sorry, where every node in such a network has a full copy of all of the code and all of the data, and every node can operate autonomously if need be, but they also coordinate and reach consensus with other nodes in the network in a distributed manner. And I find this fascinating as a metaphor relating to the rise of multicellular organisms in biology, where every cell in the body is itself an autonomous machine, also containing a full copy of the genetic code. And a body is a distributed network of such cells reaching consensus in a distributed manner. So I wonder if this is the next step in our evolution. Three distributed intelligence. Octopuses are known to be incredibly intelligent. Moreover, they have a radically different kind of intelligence to humans or even mammals or birds or anything else that we're familiar with. The nervous system of an octopus, of a common octopus has around 500 million neurons, similar to that of a dog's cortex. But unlike a dog or any mammal, reptile, bird or amphibian, these 500 million neurons are not concentrated in a single central location like a brain, but they're distributed across the entire body of the octopus, with only 10% in a central brain and two thirds in the arms. In fact, with more than 40 million neurons in each arm, almost double that of a rat's cortex, each arm is able to act independently, even communicating directly with each other without informing the central brain. Each arm is semi-autonomous, able to move, touch, taste, smell, and respond, even if severed from the body. With each arm having, an ar uh, with each arm having a mind of its own, the octopus has a kind of distributed intelligence, a very different kind of intelligence to the ones that we're accustomed to. To paraphrase the philosopher Thomas Nagel, what is it like to be an octopus? Or in fact, what is it like to be an octopus's arm? More than half a billion years ago, the lineage that would lead to octopuses and the one leading to humans separated. Was it possible, I wondered, to reach another mind on the other side of that divide? Octopuses represent the great mystery of the other. Cy Montgomery, The Soul of an Octopus, 2016. Four, quote unquote, artificial intelligence. Cephalopods are an independent experiment in the evolution of large brains and complex behavior. If we can make contact with cephalopods as sentient beings, it is not because of a shared history, not because of kinship, but because evolution built minds twice over. This is probably the closest we will come to meeting an intelligent alien. If we want to understand other minds, the minds of cephalopods are the most other of all. Peter Godfrey Smith, Other Minds, The Octopus, The Sea, and The Deep Origins of Consciousness, 2016. Here's that Google News trend graph again for the phrase artificial intelligence. And if you remember, it started exploding in 2015. And interestingly, the following year, we had not one, not two, but three, quite mainstream books released on octopuses or cephalopods. First was Soul of an Octopus, then Donna Haraway staying with the trouble, making kin in the Thulu scene, and finally, Peter Godfrey Smith's Other Minds, which I've already quoted from. These are all really wonderful books in very different ways, but of course, none of these books are really about cephalopods. Instead, these books invite us to reflect on the nature of our relationship with non-human intelligences and consciousnesses that we share our planet with. They invite us to face the final Copernican trauma that is waiting ahead of us. Centuries ago, we had discovered what was exhilarating for some, but too painful for many to accept, that we are not the only planet in existence. We eventually realized that we are not the only solar system. We are not the only galaxy. And many of our smartest today are questioning whether we are even the only universe in existence. 
Every one of these discoveries brought with it a realization that was exciting, liberating and humbling for some, but too painful for others to accept. A decentering of human exceptionalism, a Copernican turn, a Copernican trauma that pressured humanity into revisiting our perceptions on how we relate to the world, the cosmos and its human and non-human living and non-living inhabitants. With the emergence of AI, we are now facing these age old questions that we have pondered over for thousands of years through this new lens of computation and cephalopods with their incredibly advanced yet otherly intelligence represent a great example of an already existing non-human seemingly alien decentralized other mind. And now the ultimate Copernican trauma is upon us, the final decentering of human exceptionalism where this time the arena of realization is not situated outside of us, but within. It is not regarding where we are in relation to the world, but who we are. We are now faced with the reality that we may not be the sole keepers of what we, what we might consider to be intelligence, creativity, or even consciousness. Five, distributed consciousness. Much simpler with the gift of hindsight, we can now see how the dangerous dichotomy of man versus nature, gendered language used deliberately, has allowed man to justify his subjugation, or at least attempts at, of nature. And today we are experiencing the devastating consequences of this manufactured divide as we face mass extinctions, global warming, and ecological collapse. Let us meditate on the interconnectedness of all human, non-human, living and non-living things across manifold scales of time and space. Let us meditate on the awe-inspiring beauty of the universe with all its complexity and simplicity that gave rise to the different kinds of minds able to meditate back on the awe-inspiring beauty of the universe with all its complexity and simplicity. Let us depart with despair and apathy in times of ecological collapse and urgency and instead actively work towards multi-species flourishing, abandoning blind faith in gods, both the old overseers and the new techno fixers. Let us make kin and stay with the trouble. Staying with the trouble requires learning to be truly present, not as a vanishing pivot between awful or Edenic pasts and apocalyptic or salvific futures, but as mortal critters entwined in myriad unfinished configurations of places, times, matters, meanings. Donna Haraway, Staying with the Trouble, Making Kin in the Thulu Scene, 2016. We are all connected to each other, biologically, to the earth chemically, to the rest of the universe atomically. Neil deGrasse Tyson. And now I'd like to play some excerpts from a visualization of the installation. Your consciousness is not confined to your body, but extends infinitely in all directions. You are not a separate being from the rest of the universe, but an integral part of it. There is no such thing as a separate body, you are merely an accumulation of energy fields, flowing particles and vibrating strings. You are not a thing, but an interconnected web of things. I argue for a drawing of the body that includes all beings, humans, plants, animals, and bacteria. This also means thinking about the being of being. It means acknowledging that everything that is comes into being through both our bodies and not only ours. The very idea of a drawing of the body disrupts our usual view of ourselves as separate beings outside of the rest of nature. It also includes the other whose being is not like ours. The drawing of the body allows us to connect to what we might otherwise consider other beings, even other bodies, without knowing them as selves. When I look at a tree, 
I see the web of life and death stretch out before me. I see the bright green stretch of chlorophyll reaching out to capture sunlight. I do not see the tree. Or perhaps I see all of it. Whenever you see the hundreds and hundreds of stars in the sky, remember. Whenever you hear the sound of your own heart beating inside your chest, remember. Whenever you kiss the lips of one who truly loves you, remember. Whenever you feel the thunderbolt of passion pounding in your breast, remember. The atoms in your body were once inside a supernova, and they will be inside new star systems millions of years from now. You cannot leave the world, for you are not in the world. The world is not out there. The world is within you, physically and mentally. The world as you experience it through your senses is not an accurate rendition of the world, but a subjective representation of reality a hallucination filtered and constructed by your brain. This hallucination and the way that your brain constructs it is optimized for survival in a very specific environment, the African savanna, tens of thousands of years ago. It is not optimized for the modern human living in a modern environment. Since the environment has changed so much, your brain isn't always very useful anymore. It's like a Stone Age tool in the modern world. And this makes your brain very susceptible to manipulation, exploitation, and hacking. Especially now, at a time where we have the technology to transmit and share our thoughts around the world at the speed of light. The internet is not a bunch of computers connected to each other, but a bunch of human minds connected to each other. The internet is not a bunch of computers connected to each other, but a bunch of human minds connected to each other. It is an incredible technology, but technology is not neutral. Right now, the biggest tech companies are making some of the most important connections in our society, connecting people with products and services, connecting advertisers to users, and connecting voters to candidates. The decisions that tech companies make can shape society for good or ill. Their decisions and algorithms determine what people see in their news feeds. They determine what people find when they go online to look for something. They determine what people believe, shaping their views of the world. So, there are many battles to be fought. Do we want social networks that are engineered to be addictive? Or do we want them to promote healthy patterns of online communication? Do we want networks that support privacy and security? Or do we want ones that spy on us and sell our personal information? There is no more time to waste in the fantasy of separation, in the myth of apocalypse, in the fairy tales of an afterlife. How can we find the time to act? We are the ones we've been waiting for. This is our time to act. There is no more time to waste. We need 
to create new forms of wealth. We need to build new relationships and transform our old relations of domination. We must heal our bodies, restore our communities, and challenge those who are damaging the planet and its inhabitants. So those were some excerpts from this uh, this project. The, the whole thing, as I said, is over one and a half hours long, but the installation version is um, 22 minutes. And that was, I think, probably about six, seven minutes of that. Um, and the images and the text was created with, with AI, the text of GPT-3. And it was quite a mind-blowing experience to write that text it, it's about it's effectively a ten thousand word essay um it really felt like i was tapping into the wisdom of all of humanity that has been recorded online on the internet in that i obviously shaped that whole text but every single sentence that you hear was generated by tpk3 i didn't use any of my own texts any of my own sentences but i would really give gpt3 not just a prompt but huge huge texts as in i would write i would write a huge piece of text asking it a question um and it's a kind of search engine but it doesn't search for what's already out there it searches what could be out there and so this is basically that was the first part of my talk and it covers this one project and all the motivations leading up to that project. And now in the second part of my talk, I'd like to reflect on some of the developments that have happened since then. So GPT-3 and I was using Clip Guided VQGAN. <clears throat> this is all based on a technology called Transformers, which was quite recent at the time. Um, and I was using a very preliminary version of this technology that uses Transformers to generate images from text. At the time that I made both the, this this particular project um, and the video that I showed before, all watched over by Machines of Love and Grace. So I made those early last year, June, July, August. At the time, um, it was quite difficult to use this these technologies. It was particularly difficult to control. There was no tools out there to make videos, so this required a lot of coding. It was quite inaccessible. But as you know, a lot has happened since then and i find that my title distributed consciousness takes on a whole new meaning so you're all familiar with these things so i'll go past this quite quickly this is dali 2 it's um, an online service by a company called OpenAI, who are also behind gpt3 they're also behind clip clip came out in january 2021 and that underlies all of what's happening right now with regards to prompt-based image generation um, and some other stuff that I'm going to talk about later. The basic idea, just to remind if any of you aren't familiar, you write a piece of text, for example, a 3D render of a cute tropical fish in an aquarium on a dark blue background, digital art. And it's like, it's like a Google search, except it doesn't search what exists. It searches the space of what could exist. So it's more of a search and synthesis engine as, a, as opposed to a search and retrieve engine. And it generates these images. So I was lucky enough to be on the private beta, uh, the early private beta of DALI 2 earlier this year. So these are some of my experiments trying to create some tentacular critters. And I'm deliberately not selecting just a few really good ones. Instead, I want to show you tons. Um, in fact, this is still a small selection. I have hundreds, if not thousands of more of these, because I really want to express not the individual images, but the space of possibilities that is captured and expressed by the model. Because I think that's what's so going to be, I don't use this phrase lightly, a game changer. Of course, there's a million entirely different ideas that one could explore with these kinds of models, but you know, coming on with my theme, I'm interested in these weird glass-like deep sea critters. Um, and I'm just exploring variations. It's a very iterative process if you've worked with these systems. It's very iterative in that it doesn't just give you a thousand images. 
um, although it could if you program it that way, but generally it gives you four images. Um, and then you look at it, you fine tune your prompt, and then you try again. Or you can select your favorite image and say, give me more like this one. Um, so it is very iterative and you do feel a connection to, to what you create. So you might notice something about these images that while the content is very interesting, at least I think these are very, very interesting images, the content, the content is interesting. Um, the image themselves aren't necessarily what we might think of as quote unquote pretty images in that the framing and composition aren't how an artist might frame or compose these images. One could think of the subject matter of the image, you might think of it as a sculpture, and that sculpture is an artwork. Um, and these images are kind of almost random photographs of these sculptures. Or you could think of these as design concepts, a concept art for a movie or a game or, or a sculpture. But the images themselves, the composition, the framing is not necessarily uh, masterfully composed. They're cropped quite randomly, almost as if there's a universe of these creatures. And here we're seeing photographs or some kind of documentation of that universe. So this is quite specific to Dali. And I'll talk a little bit more about this when I come to Mid Journey because that's very different. But even so, within Dali, I try to create some, you know, quote unquote, pretty images. And it's possible, of course. Um, I'm continuously trying very slight variations on the prompts to just push and push it in different directions. And so the prompts are very key, obviously, like saying things like, a beautiful artistic photograph of an intricate glass sculpture of an alien-like deep sea creature with tentacles and feelers shot in a studio against a light background. So the more details you give it, uh, the more you can steer it towards what you're after. And yeah, I mean, I my mind was blown when I was playing with this because you saw that video that I made um, of me reading the poem. That was... Uh, yeah, it was kind of all around the same time, basically. And the image quality of this is just another level. Um, oh, sorry, I made that video last year. So, and then this came out this year. But besides the aesthetics of the images, what really blows my mind is the understanding of light. Um, the shadows, reflections, refractions, translucency, even subsurface scattering all seems quite accurate. And it might not be mathematically or physically perfectly accurate, but to a first approximation, it's definitely very convincing. I mean, look at those shadows and translucencies. And I'd, ar and I'd argue that these are quite photorealistic, as in they look like actual photographs of real objects, which are the opposite of mid-journey, which I'll come to shortly. But I tried, even within Dali, I tried other approaches. These are some concept sketches for similar creatures. Um, and here are some technical illustrations. And I have to say, I'm very impressed with the level of consistency within each image in that there are different perspectives of the same structure in each image. It's not different perspectives of different structures. So internally, the model has a representation of this 3D structure and it's able to give multiple perspectives of that structure, which actually later I'm going to show some more recent research, which demonstrates that, yeah, this is what's happening. Here are some annotated diagrams, which are quite hilarious. And while these diagrams aren't accurate enough to be usable as, you know, design diagrams for actual projects in industry, they do serve as fuel for imagination. And that's a key point I'm going to come to later. But an another point I'd like to emphasize is, and this is really key, the tools available to us right now are pretty much raw research. These are not tools that were designed for humans to use with usability in mind, with our goals and needs, or the needs of creative professionals in mind. This is all raw research. Oh, my.
my um, PowerPoint seems to have frozen. So we don't need to worry about the AI uprising just yet. Do you want to reshare? Sorry? Do you want to reshare your screen? Yeah, I'm going to have to quit PowerPoint and I'll be back in a second. Sorry. Uh -huh. Okay. Almost there. Okay. So, as I was saying, the these tools are pretty much raw research they are not tools that were designed for end users and the needs of end users in mind oh it's oh but now that the technology has demonstrated its full potential i'm expecting lots of funding to flow into not just research but into tools into software specifically designed for end users with the needs of end users in mind, with the needs of creative industries in mind. So whatever it is that graphic designers need, advertisers need, architects need, Hollywood people need, this is what we're going to be seeing over the next few years. So if you've been surprised at what's been happening these last few years, over the next few years, prepare to be, well, Expect the unexpected is what I will say for now. So these last experiments I want to show from DALI is this series where I'm trying a very different aesthetic. Astronauts seem to be <clears throat> a, a thing. That's because actually they had, DALI had trouble with faces. So they, to show humans, they couldn't show humans with faces. So they showed astronauts. So I, I was playing with that. I was riffing off that. Going for a more puppet stop motion aesthetic here. Um, very much inspired by Wes Anderson films. And I'm quite happy with how these turned out. Really the takeaway, the key takeaway from this whole section is this software is not a tool. It's not just a tool to augment my creativity. It's a tool to expand my imagination. And that's a really, really key thing that I'm gonna come back over and over again. And I wanna end with. But first, I want to talk a little bit about Mid Journey. So this is a similar tool from a small startup. These are some images that I created with Mid Journey. They have a very different aesthetic. The creator um, and founder, David Holtz, has said in many interviews, he didn't want to create something that could be used for deep fakes. He's not after creating photorealistic images, but rather beautiful images. And clearly, Mid Journey is optimized to do exactly that. Um, where the image is well composed and the image itself is aesthetically very strong. And I found designing in Mid Journey feels more intuitive compared to Dali because you can go really far with variations. And I'll talk about that shortly. Again, I've produced ridiculously large amounts of images, many, many thousands in, in a few days. Just manually going through, choosing the images I like, and then saying, give me more images like this one. So every single image you're seeing here is from the same prompt, from the same seed, but I just keep selecting images and just branching off. It's a kind of evolution. And again, remember, Mid Journey is a very basic, very simple, and actually quite a difficult to use tool with a tiny team, no external funding. It's an experiment. What we lack right now is the ability to, for example, say things like, I like the shape of this particular image, but I want it covered in diamonds, like in this other image. I want this to go, this bit to glow like it does in that image. Currently, we can't communicate any of this to the software. But that's more of a UI problem than a fundamental research problem. And that is what I believe will be coming in the next few years. And that is going to change everything once again. So when that starts to come, expect another major shift. Already from last year to right now, this is, I think this is huge what's happening. 
So this was all a tiny selection of images from a part from a particular series of works um, that I, I made, as I said, through kind of selective breeding. Um, for example, this is these four images would be the output of one iteration. And then I select one or more that I like, and I say, give me more like that one. And over many, many, many generations, it the outputs just diversify. So these images are not in chronological order, but they're random. But you can see, for example, how some of these things have a, a massive glass bulb-like head, while others don't. So somewhere along the line, one iteration might have randomly had a tiny little bulb-like thing on its head, and I would have reproduced that one. And consistently, every child that came out, I would always pick the largest child. And over time, we get ones with really massive glass bulb heads. So it is really like evolution, where my aesthetic preference is the fitness function, the evolutionary selective pressure. So a key thing to underline is that I didn't imagine any of these things in my head. The creature, the, the computer is imagining and generating these. I'm just selecting what I like and I'm saying, give me more like that. And I'm repeating this over and over. The software is doing the imagining, I'm doing filtering. This is key, I'm gonna get back to this. Um, so I tweeted this a while ago. It's crazy that I used to need a multi-GPU, multi-monitor, full-size tower, custom workstation, and months of coding, tens of thousands of lines of code to make AI art. And now I can just tap on the variations button on my phone while I'm driving. I love this future. Uh, this is a true story. I, um, I, I literally made a lot of these while I was driving. Like I had Discord open on my phone, on my dashboard, and while I'm driving, it pops up. I mean, don't use your phone while driving. During a red light, I'll say. I just press the one that I like. It, it's, it's quite crazy that this is how it works, that I can do it while driving. So here, these came from the same prompt, um, but a whole other world that I, I traced down. Um, again, I made thousands of these. I'm going to skip through some of these. This is another series. Um, Again, all from the same prompt, just variations and selective breeding. And I'm quite happy with these images. So there has been this belief that menial, repetitive, physical tasks would be automated first. Factory workers, that happened, of course, to quite some degree, you know, driving, deliveries, etc. But it was believed that so-called creative jobs would be safe from automation. I've never believed this. In fact, quite the opposite. The physical world can be way more complicated to navigate than the mental world because building clever robots is a lot harder than building clever software because clever robots need clever software. And on top of that, they need the physical mechanical dexterity to navigate the physical world, which pure software agents don't need. So five years ago, I made the prediction, and I don't usually make predictions, but five years ago, I made the prediction that within five years, AI would be able to generate a video from text. I was close. Um, what I missed was I thought we'd have to provide a database of videos and the software would search that database, select videos from that database and edit, zoom, reframe according to our text. Turns out that Generation software doesn't even need access to a database of videos. It just needs a pre-trained model, trained mostly on images and some videos. So this is some of the stuff that's been happening very recently. This is Make a Video from Facebook, released this week. It's quite basic. It generates short video clips from text prompts. Again, this isn't a web search. It's not finding these videos from the internet. It's generating them. can also bring still images to life. It can also, given a short video, generate similar videos as well. This is Imogen from Google. It's very similar. It generates short video clips from a text prompt. 
both of these ones that I just showed, you give it one prompt, like one sentence, and it generates a video of that one thing. Um, but there's also this, Fenaki from Google. Here, note that the software takes long prompts. It takes full paragraphs and note how the videos evolve. For example, on the left, the teddy bear is swimming and then it goes underwater and it keeps swimming under the water and then there's colorful fishes and then it's a panda bear swimming underwater. This one in the middle, it was diving in the ocean and then it will emerge from the water Oh, my video looped. I didn't capture that bit, but I'll come. I'll just go to the next one. This is a two minute video that follows this narrative. The alien spaceship arrives to a futuristic city. The camera gets inside the alien spaceship and moves forward until there's an astronaut in the blue room. The astronaut is typing in the keyboard. The camera moves away from the astronaut and walks to the left. The astronaut leaves the keyboard and walks away. The camera moves beyond the astronaut and looks at the screen. The screen behind the astronaut displays fish swimming in the sea. Crash zoom into the blue fish. We follow the blue fish as it swims in the dark ocean. The camera points up to the sky through the water, the ocean and the coastline of a futuristic city. You get the idea. This is a full two minute text that a video is generated for. And yes, the image quality isn't amazing, but remember that this was state-of-the-art image generation in 2015. I'll let you look at these images. This was the resolution and image quality in 2015, DC GAN. And this was the image quality and resolution in 2017, just two years later, progressive growing of GANs. And this isn't even state-of-the-art. After progressive growing of GANs, the following year was style GAN. The year after that was style GAN 2 and then style GAN 3. So in two years, we went from what I just showed you to this. This is the thing to remember, the not even the slope of progress, but the curvature of slope of progress. Um, but also we have dream fusion. So this is generating 3D models from text. Again, it's very preliminary, but it's more important to think about the slope of progress. So these are, uh, yeah, it's pr pretty much similar to DALI, but in 3D. We also have a human motion model um, from folks at Tel Aviv University here. This generates human movement animation from text. So you describe the animation that you want, and this isn't video, this is bipedal skeletal animation data. Um, it generates, animation that can blend and it does the sequence of actions that you want it to do. This is also very new. The other thing I want to talk about, this is not so new, um, NERFs, neural radiance fields. This came out actually two years ago. Um, it's not a generative model or text-based, rather it's, it's a new 3D representation. It's a new way of capturing and representing 3D scene information in a neural network, including material properties, like how the material um, responds to light and reflections. It's similar to photogrammetry in that you give the system a bunch of photos of, of a scene from different perspectives, and it constructs a continuous representation of it. But the difference from photogrammetry is that while photogrammetry just gives you a textured 3D point cloud or a mesh, if you mesh it, it just generates static data, which you then use soft, your software to render. Whereas this, it outputs a neural network, which stores the full 3D scene information in a continuous format, including the material properties, and such that you can render the scene in real time from the neural network with all of the correct, almost photorealistic material properties, specular ref reflections, etc. And so NERF came out, NERFs came out in 2020. Um, and it would take up to a few days to create a 3D model out of a bunch of photographs. So you take the bunch of photographs, you 
train the model for a few days um, and you'd get the thing, get this. So there's a question. I guess I'll come to questions later. Um, and then I think earlier this year, NVIDIA optimized the heck out of this. And instead of just a few days, it can create this in a few minutes, even a few seconds to create that model. And then it can render in pretty much real time. We don't need the music. So remember, nerfs aren't just a 3D capture mechanism. It's a whole new way of representing and rendering 3D. So note, for example, the reflections in the water here. Um, this is all the nerf rendering as well. So the nerf captures the 3D environment from the photos and then renders it. It's it. Th there is no point cloud. There is no 3D geometry. It's not a voxel space. It's a continuous function stored in the neural network. Again, in this one, look at all the reflections on the window, on the windows. This is captured via nerfs, also um, rendered via the nerfs. So that's what's been happening this last year. And now I want to wrap up with some final thoughts. Of course, there's lots of issues and questions around these technologies, where they're at and where they're going. I'm only going to mention a few of them very briefly because I want to focus on one particular topic at the very end. Uh, but just to summarize some of the things that are being spoken about, there are legal and ethical questions around what's happening. These models are trained on billions of images on the internet, including the works of artists that are alive without their consent. So what are the legal and ethical implications of using artists' works to train these models without their consent? Especially bearing in mind, we can create new images that resemble pretty much exactly those artists' work without the original artists being compensated or even acknowledged. And there's a huge backlash happening right now online to what people call AI art and AI artists. How do we or do we manage consent of works being used for training such models? According to my understanding and my research and discussions with copyright and IP lawyers, current copyright law does allow for the scraping of data to be used in such models. But interestingly, the output of the models cannot be copyrighted because it is generated by a machine. And for it to be copyrighted, it requires significant intervention by a human author. So clearly the technology is developing much quicker than our legal systems. Um, and how will copyright law evolve now with these technologies becoming so powerful and ubiquitous? Since these models are trained on data on the internet, they encode within them all of our biases. What are the downstream effects of this? And how can this be mitigated? What will be the impact of these technologies on jobs, jobs in creative sectors, designers, illustrators, storyboard artists, 3D modelers, composers, video editors, script writers? Of course, lots of new job roles will be created. People will still be needed to operate these new AI powered software, but the level of productivity that this, that this basically allows is that I believe in many industries, I believe one single person using one of this software will be able to replace 10, maybe many more junior designers and illustrators. So the junior design roles will be the first to go. And this, the junior design roles are often how designers get their foot in the door. So while I believe many adaptive artists will find huge success in the future, it could become very difficult, even more difficult for any for many young artists and designers to get their foot into various jobs. These tools require immense computational power to develop. So what are the consequences of this power being in the hands of so few and distributed to the masses only at their whim and under their control? There are also some interesting questions that are more philosophical in nature, but have very direct practical consequences, such as, and these are being discussed a lot around on social media, is it art? Who is the artist? Is it me? Is it the machine? Is it the software developers? 
Is it the millions of people around the world that are alive whose data the model was trained on? Now, I have some thoughts on this, but I can appreciate how some opinions might differ. So I'd like to pose a slightly simpler question by removing the amorphous term art and instead ask, who is the author? Is it me? Is it the machine? Is it the software developers? Is it the millions of people whose data the model was trained on? And I think this question actually has a simple answer. I think the answer is yes, all of the above. Or maybe it's no. Um, I think the concept of authorship as it has existed in the past is quickly becoming obsolete, if not already obsolete. This is Mid Journey. It's a Discord bot. You type your prompt in the public chat and the results appear almost instantly in front of everybody. The way that Mid Journey works is very much geared towards emphasizing the evaporation of the concept of the lone author. And as much as I hate the complete sensory overload that is Discord, I really love this aspect of Mid Journey. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Discord, First, I envy you. Second, um, it's, it's basically a public chat. Imagine a WhatsApp group with a million people on it. So in real time, a million people are writing their prompts in this public chat where everyone can see and the results are automatically generated in near real time and posted back into the chat. Anybody can copy paste the prompt or even directly branch off an image that they see. This is a complete stream of collective consciousness. And I find this quite beautiful because it is acknowledging and making a feature of the fact that the images that are created are the result of a distributed consciousness. But the problem is our society and value systems and everything around it is structured to emphasize and elevate so-called quote unquote valuable individuals. Everything about our pop culture is focused on heroes and heroines, whether it's celebrities, influencers, pop stars, even Hollywood is literally just heroes and heroines saving the day. So I don't know how or even if our culture can shift to a culture that celebrates collective shared authorship. And this is a huge topic unto itself and a very subjective one. Um, but I'd like to leave that there for you to think about. And I'd like to switch to perhaps a more practical but difficult question around well, first, I'll start with creativity and novelty and originality um, and machines being creative. It's very, very oft quoted quote from Lady Ada Lovelace, computing and software pioneer. Um, and she very famously said, the analytical engine has no pretensions whatever to originate anything. It can do whatever we know how to order it to perform. It can follow analysis, but it has no power of anticipating any analytical revelations or truths. Its province is to assist us in making available what we are already acquainted with. She wrote this in 1843, and here, like 160, no, 180, almost two centuries later, we're still um, arguing about this. Thousands of words, thousands of books and papers have been written on this. But I don't even want to focus on this topic. I want to leave this for later. I will say that there should be no doubt in anyone's mind that using these tools, my creativity has gone to levels that were inconceivable just a few years ago. So just parking the idea of is the machine being creative, I wanna focus on me. My output just in the last year, these last few weeks, these last few days is ludicrous. It's beyond comprehension. Um, it's, it's, it's a paradigm shift. I don't use that phrase lightly. I don't even yet fully know how to deal with the magnitude of stuff that I'm creating that's filling up my hard drives. So there should be no doubt that my creativity or rather the creativity of the system that is me plus the machine is in another dimension. But what about imagination? And this is my final thought and, and I am now wrapping up. My final question I'd like to leave you with. Um, the term AI has a lot of baggage when I say AI, there's so much happening in each of your heads. I don't know what's going on in each of your heads. So I don't want to use the word AI. I just want to focus on what's really happening. And what's really happening is that there's the software that's learning. And the key thing is it's learning from almost everything that's on the internet. It's learning from this archive of the almost the entirety of human knowledge that has been put online. 
which is, of course, a tiny fraction of the entirety of human knowledge and the human experience, but it's still a heck of a lot. It's still a heck of a lot more than a single human mind can manage. So when we interact with these models, we are somehow interacting with a model, an imperfect model, but a model nevertheless, of the entirety of recorded human knowledge online. All of these images that I've shown you today, I did not imagine in my head. I'll be honest, I do feel authorship over them because I spent many laborious hours and weeks and sometimes even months steering and honing in on these particular outcomes. There was a creative process involved with intent. So I do feel authorship. And I did start with a vision in my head, but I did not start with these particular visions in my head. I just chose what I liked from the selection given to me by the software. And there's nothing wrong with that. There are many creative jobs today that work on that basis. But I just would like to acknowledge that a generator is a very different thing from a discriminator. I love Chopin, the composer, pianist. I know that I love Chopin. I can hear a Chopin nocturne. And even if I've never heard that particular piece before, I'll probably like it. And I might even recognize it to be Chopin. So I'm a very good musical discriminator. I know what I like. But being a composer, is more than knowing what you like. Being a composer is typically, not always, I'll get to that, but being a composer is about imagining a sequence of notes and then bringing them to life, bringing them into the world by writing them down. Now, there are some people who hear or see things entirely in their head and they want to bring it into the world. This happens to me, I know what that's like. Sometimes some of these people have the skills to bring those things into the world, either directly themselves or by hiring other skilled people. And as such, they become artists or directors or composers. They imagine and then they create. Sometimes there are people who also see or hear things entirely in their head, but unfortunately they do not have the skills or opportunities, um, which could be funding or access to equipment, to realize their visions, to bring their visions into the world. They become very frustrated. I know because this also happens to me. Now, these tools are going to be mind-blowingly liberating for both types of people, both the people who don't have the practical skills or opportunities to realize their vision, but also to the people who do have the skills because there is an immense acceleration here. But in reality, most of us, myself included, operate in between these two extremes where sometimes you don't imagine the entirety of what you want to create up front. Rather, it's a very iterative process between making an act of creation, seeing the results, that sparking some new ideas, trying that out and repeating. This is analogous to jamming, improvising, drawing or music, etc. The key thing is, in all of these scenarios, there is some imagining, some pre-visualization happening within the head. And what's happening when we're working with these particular tools is we are not having to pre-visualize in our head. We are externalizing imagination. And we had already started externalizing our memory and cognition to external devices tens of thousands of years ago. First, we started externalizing our memory. Then we started externalizing actual cognitive processes. We started externalizing thinking, calculating, decision-making. And all of this externalization came with benefits and disadvantages. For one thing, it's made what's happening right now possible. Here I am in California. Some of you are in Europe, China, all over the world. My image and sound is being beamed to you on electrons and photons at the speed of light. We forget how immensely incredible this is. But we also know there is a downside to this. This is a Faustian bargain. There is evidence that our attention spans are getting shorter and our memory is becoming more fragmented. There are neurological changes happening within us. I, for one, when I was in my teens and 20s, used to be someone who could sit down and finish a book in a day or two. I would read nonstop eight hours a day, every day. Now I'm reading 10 books at the same time. I can't finish any. I can barely finish an article. There's neurological changes happening in my brain. So while right now, when I use these tools, I have no doubt that my creativity is plowing through to another dimension. And my imagination is plowing through to another dimension as well. That cannot be questioned because I am, and this is, I accept, perhaps a bit of a provocation, a provocative way of wording it, in effect, collaborating with every single person in the creation and output of this tool, which is almost everybody in the world. 
And at every iteration of my creative process, I evaluate the results of our collective imagination and the results of the fruits of our collective consciousness, our distributed collective consciousness. And this is amazing. I have no doubt this is taking me and all of humanity's creativity and imagination to other dimensions. But this is how it is today. What about tomorrow? Today, I am able to combine and merge my imagination with the imagination of the collective consciousness as filtered through the machine. But what about in 10 years, especially when these tools are infinitely better? Would I even need an imagination? Will we value human imagination? And what happens to imagination if we have no value for it? I'm not asking for humanity on the whole, if that is even a meaningful distinction, but I mean as for individual brains. We used to have to hunt for food. Now, thankfully, we have supermarkets. We don't have to worry about where food is coming from. We have nutrition science. We have gyms. The fastest and strongest people to have ever lived are alive right now. This is the pinnacle of physical condition among our top athletes, thanks to these developments. On the other hand, one in two people are obese, at least here in the US. People are literally dying from eating too much food and not moving. We can't memorize phone numbers anymore because we don't need to. We can't do long division anymore because we don't need to. Instead, our minds are liberated from these menial tasks, allowing a tiny percentage, the best of us, to design flying robots that can land on faraway comets or measure the minuscule vibrations in the fabric of space-time caused by supermassive black holes colliding billions of years ago. While most of us are liberated to freely sat slouch around on sofas watching the Kardashians on TV. I have no doubt that many people will keep on creating and imagining and augmented with these kinds of software will become superhuman creators. But I wonder if one in two people will completely lose all trace of anything that resembles imagination, especially if from an early age, we're plugged into apps that just give us a constant stream of mind numbing content. Similar to today, how we give our young children iPads to play with to shut them up and keep them quiet. But most responsible parents limit screen time and make sure the kids do get to play games that develop their physical and mental faculties. But what if kids in 10, 20 years time don't have to imagine anything? They grow up immersed in a virtual environment that is generated on the fly based on some kind of galvanic or biometric response to exactly maximize their pleasure because that's what's most profitable. How will their minds develop or not develop? So I don't know if this will happen. I'm just wondering, I'm trying to imagine, if you pardon the pun, one potential future out of many potential futures. In the same way that our brains are being rewired due to the externalization of memory and many cognitive processes, what will the long-term impact on our individual brains? What will, what will be the long-term impact on our individual brains due to an externalization of imagination on this scale? as we all gradually tend towards becoming discriminators instead of generators. In addition to what this technology enables, what does it disable? What is the Faustian bargain that we are imagining? Imagine prompt, a Faustian bargain externalizing our imagination to computers trained on huge data sets scraped from the internet. The imagination of the collective consciousness filtered through the machine is infinitely more vast than any single human could possibly comprehend. Very detailed, dramatic, epic, hyper real, trending on art station, 8K, Unreal Engine, dash dash AR 16.9. And that's what that looks like. So that's the end of my talk. Thank you for your patience. It went on a bit longer than I'd anticipated. A lot of this material was kind of brand new. So I was improvising a lot. Um, but yeah. Thanks for listening. Uh, thank you, Emma. That, that was truly extraordinary. Um, and I'm still processing it myself. Um, but I have, I just kind of like, a, maybe just to kick things off, um, and I'm sure there'll be lots of questions coming. Can I simply say that those who are watching on Billy Billy and YouTube can send us um, some questions and of course those on the Zoom chat can also directly send those questions to us. But the one thing I, I wanted to, to, to to raise, but I don't want to go off on a, a tangent, but I think what um, the, the, the thing about the cephalopod, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, is that 
it is the most extraordinary um, creature in terms of kind of, let's say, camouflage um, compared to the chameleon even. I mean, the chameleon is, is fascinating in itself because it, it can't smell, it can't hear, but it has this most sophisticated visual apparatus. But it's far exceeded by the cephalopod because of the, the speed of interaction. And it really is, um, and that's no doubt due to its distributed consciousness, the way that it can actually change its color and so on. It, it's, it's certainly a kind of a, a it's, it's an extraordinary creature in many ways. Now, we could go to the question about the, the, the kind of question about images and things and, and camouflage and all those kind of questions, which maybe we can after later on. But I want us to, to raise a, another kind of question that is to do with the um, what's implied behind all that is the notion of adaptation um, as a kind of fundamental kind of drive in some sense. And I'm kind of, um, I'm left wondering, um, uh, because what, what you string together is an astonishing tapestry of all these different sort of thoughts and things. And I'm wondering about the, the notions of adaptation that are, are, are exist within both um, uh, the kind of neuroscientific sort of view of, of how our brains are, are kind of these um, adaptive systems, but also in terms of the environment as a whole. And the term that really comes out, and it's always leaped, leapt out of me, is the notion of homeostasis. In other words, there is some kind of balancing device that, that, went, that goes on. And, and William Ashby famously, of course, was trying to explore how the brain could be understood as a homeostat. He did these sort of crude models, but it was this notion of a balancing a develop balancing device. But then you could sort of take that, and, and, and the same goes also for the work of Antonio Damasio, the neuroscientist who's obsessed with this notion of homeostasis as the way the brain operates, not as a central command center, as though the brain's telling what to do, but something that is kind of like almost like a hydraulic system that is keeping us within a certain sort of uh, 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 homeostatic state. And you can extend that still further um, by thinking about um, the work of Francesco Varela, who's thinking about how we adapt to the environment, or indeed even the notion of, uh, of the environment itself as being some uh, adaptive system, the kind of James Lovelock sort of understanding of Gaia and things. So um, this is at the back of my mind, this kind of question about the, 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 the homeostatic or the adaptation whereby uh, we can um, survive, as it were. So I mean, in some ways, I, I wanted to throw that at you as a kind of thought, but also to ask this question, well, doesn't that seem to imply that actually that we'll be okay, whatever happens, and we'll find some way of adapting or balancing of dealing with all these things? Um, because you hold out this, this possibility that actually this is going to lead to disaster. But I would say, well, maybe we will simply adapt and we will, it will accommodate all those things. So maybe I could throw that at you first of all, and maybe we can come back to the question about camouflage later on. But, um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, um, so there's a, there's a lot in that question. I I, I did I, I did want to start actually with the, the camouflage thing. Okay. So I didn't mention that in my talk at all. But um, you're totally right. I mean, cephalopods are incredible masters of disguise, um, not just in terms of color but also texture. Um, you know, they have little sacks on their skin that they can raise that make that so they can make their skin smooth or bumpy or and it's quite incredible that they can a, do this so quickly, but also that they perfectly know what is underneath them without. So there's lots of um, kind of hypotheses as to how do they actually sense light through their skin to be able to do this, to be able to sit on a rock and then perfectly almost become invisible. Um, so that that's an incredible adaptation in um, Simon Montgomery's book, The Soul of an Octopus she actually talks about trying to measure intelligence is such an anthropocentric um, thing Like we give these octopuses puzzles to solve and they're super smart, they solve all the puzzles, but actually the way an octopus might want to uh, do an intelligent test is to ask, well, how many different textures can you go through per second? So according to an octopus, we might be really, really dumb because intelligence is measured to our own metrics. So I, th I just wanted to mention that I thought that was a really funny, um, a, a funny story. So a really fascinating question that I don't know if there is an answer to is regarding adaptation, we didn't necessarily evolve to, to do all this. Like evolution's optimization function is trying to optimize for effectively getting better at making better babies. And for octopuses, this turned out to be 
camouflage used to be a very good adaptation mechanism because they have they're very soft they can um they're basically sacks of protein so they're hunted by lots of things so they they became smart and they became very good at camouflage so i find it fascinating that we were optimized to be getting better at making better babies and then here we are building things like zoom or tax filing uh mortgage or poetry so one thing I often wonder is we keep building these worlds, um, but I don't know, like depression is quite a, a major problem we have in the world. So clearly we haven't figured everything out. A lot of people are unhappy. There is a lot of suffering. So even though we are really clever in that we can build flying robots, we haven't solved the problem of how do we make people happy? Um, how do we make the masses happy? I mean, we have the threat of a nuclear war right now. I mean, I mean, it's just mind boggling that we haven't managed to find a solution to war. Like this is the priority, I would think. Um, Zoom is great. Uh, but so when I think of in in humans as an intelligent species, I sometimes think individually we are quite intelligent. In small groups, we are quite intelligent. Um, we're very intelligent. I mean, we we have quantum mechanics, we have general relativity. But really, as a as a as a society, I really question our intelligence. Um, if we are destroying our home, then I can't say that we're an intelligent species. Going back to your question, I've kind of gone on digression, but I am going to pull it back with regards to you know, we'll be fine. I have no doubt that we can survive. Um, but that's not really what I'm questioning. What I'm questioning is we seem to be moving without much foresight. We like I remember seeing an interview with um, Eric Schmidt, the previous CEO of, of Google, and he said, we had no idea what we were doing. I'm just a network engineer. Um, you know, we had a really good product. And we just were just moving along. So as our technology becomes more and more powerful, I think moving like this without wisdom of what will happen in the future is potentially more and more dangerous. So, I mean, I could talk more about this, but I want to give time for some other questions. I don't know if that kind of answers your question. Or would you like me to go, go on? You're, you're muted. No, it's um, no, it's it's. I think it's an ongoing question. I think it's kind of like it has to remain in the background to think about how that goes. But it does seem to sort of. I, I think the question of homeostasis is, is an incredibly interesting one. How how um, things begin to sort of balance out, and I, I do think that also James Lovelock's kind of theory is, which of course is completely unproven and so on, but nonetheless kind of like is is fascinating. You know, as a kind of provocation to think of how we. How we can how we how we exist in, a, in in the world um and that connection i think Borella is also a, a, a very important sort of link in terms of thinking about how we relate to the environment i i thought that there's a question for daniela just coming up can i just quickly ask one more question um i was i was um particularly fascinated by your kind of discussion about that we're all becoming discriminators um just for those who kind of like are not aware of this i should just explain that the whole principle of the gan the generative adversarial network is there are two different networks one that is generating images, uh, and then there's a discriminator that is judging those images. And of course, we typically, uh, we understand that, that through this process that the generator learns how to generate better images because the discriminator is kind of rejecting the ones that aren't good enough and so on. But it's also the other side of the coin, which I think is very interesting, is the idea that actually the discriminator is also learning something from the generator. So I want to just kind of throw that out there. I mean, what has already struck me as being a kind of interesting um, situation that we're getting right now is that there are people, let me take Lev Manovich, or even myself, frankly, for that matter, people who are kind of trained in one domain, which is to do with, let's say, the visual domain and to do with generation of, of something, um, but have become theorists, so critics in a way. And what this new process has enabled in some sense is by cutting through all the kind of the, 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 the technical issues is for those people like Lev Manovich to become really quite good at generating those images. Because the, over time, 
he is about being a critic has also been absorbing this kind of this kind of creative impulse that's coming from the generator. So I, I, my view would be that actually, you know, you could take the absolute opposite sort of view in the sense that say that, well, actually, we shouldn't be too worried about this because actually we are being trained um, by the generator to become ever more creative. We have, a, I think, a new individual we could call the creative critic that's also a kind of artist or designer of some sort of kind. But it's that sort of mechanism. I'm not quite sure whether you're referring to the GAN, but it seems to me that, that from that point of view, it is fascinating what is happening to, to the critic. And I think in any case, in, in culture as a whole, our, our kind of modus operandi has been increasingly to kind of like, let's say taking a photograph, you, you, you now sample things. You take hundreds of photographs and then select one out of that, which is very different to the old fashioned notion of setting up that one perfect shot that would be taken and you only find out later whether it's good enough. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that I think out of this kind of culture of sampling and exposure to all these images, there is something incredibly positive happening in the sense we are, we are actually learning to be um, creative or to be able to appreciate uh, um, cr creative outcomes, let me say. What do you think of that sort of thesis? Um, so, so, yeah, first of all, the, the GAN reference is, is, is partly there. The, the, the terms of generative models and discriminative models predate GANs by like a century or something. Um, so I, I'm referring to the concept of generative models and discriminative models in that generative models learn how to generate. So generative models learn how to generate data uh, and discriminative models learn to differentiate. So image classification models are also discriminative models. Um, and GANs just happen to use both in a kind of um, minimax game of they both try and fight against each other. So th there is that aspect. But really, I'm also kind of getting away from that, that particular metaphor. I'm referring to the fact that a lot of people, people are generally good discriminators. Uh, many people, if they see a picture of a cat or a picture of a dog, they will say, that's a cat, that's a dog. But that doesn't mean that they can draw a cat or a dog. Um, that is a generative capability. So this is what I'm referring to. And this is quite, quite key. And again, just to repeat, all of us, we've evolved to be good discriminators so that if we see a bear, we run. If we see a tiger, we run. Um, if we see a cute little baby, we don't run. We, we look after it. This, this is discrimination. Discrimination obviously is a, has negative connotations, particularly when you think of like gender and race. So I'm using discrimination in the statistical sense here. Um, let me just say telling apart. Whereas that doesn't mean that we all have the skills to draw a bear or draw a baby. So what you're saying about it's amplifying our creativity, um, I completely agree. And I, I would hope that I try to underline that in my presentation, but it's the combination of me plus the machine, which is becoming more creative. If after 20 years of that, you remove the machine, what is left? That's what I'm asking. So right now, Lev Manovich, you, um, you feel more generative than you were before me too like the images that i've gen i've created like thousands tens of thousands of images in the last few months i could not have created those by myself without the machine so i am definitely more creative and my imagination in my head is bigger i, I will also say my imagination is expanding because i've been looking at tens of thousands of images i am absorbing these so right now my creativity and imagination is expanding my question is after 20 years of this, if you remove the machine, what is left? So it's the relationship with the externalization, um, what is left within me? So we are becoming cyborgs, we are already cyborgs, but yeah, I'm just trying to think about the consequences of what this might be. Um, so yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, I just, I mean, talk, I have one comment, I, mean, I think that, uh... Sure, we immediately we see a bear run away. But I think what I, I find fascinating about uh, human beings is the speed at which our, our aesthetic um, awareness kind of like, you no. Know, so, for example, we'll taste a cocktail and immediately say, oh, I like that or not, you know, and, and actually very, very quickly with an image, I like it or sound, I like it. So there is a kind of a, a very sophisticated kind of level of aesthetic discrimination that, that we've, we've, we've developed. Um, 
So we've got a, we've got several questions. Um, uh, we've got uh, uh, first of all, actually, Angelica put a number of questions in the chat, and Angelica is with us on the um, uh, in the Zoom chat. So um, and then we've got Danielle and we've got Yi Guo. Maybe because Angelica, are you were able to um, to ask a question. You're on iPad. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hi, hi, Neil. Uh, hi. hi. Uh, hi, thanks for an amazing lecture. Uh, I think it's one of the best so far for me and uh, the, the doctoral consortium as from all of them. I'm just amazed by it. And my first question was a little technical one, but then uh, it evolved, of course. I uh, was just wondering if you try to use a mix of uh, DALI and MidJourney, like inputting uh, mid -journey, your mid-journey mid outputs when you said it, you couldn't improve them. You can put it in DALI and then do in-painting, out-painting. And the other question was regarding uh, the database and the artificial database. Are we uh, current uh, the the risk of auto referentiating ourselves or generating too much artificial uh, database to be uh, auto referentiated? What about uh, our original human uh, creativity in all of that? It's just uh, it's because also because of maybe some copyright issues was one thing that I thought. Uh, of using images uh, as a, artificial images to generate other images instead of using copyrighted images. Just, just I don't know if I'm, if I'm clear, but uh. yeah, very, very clear, very, very, very clear. Uh, very good questions. So regarding your first question, I haven't really done thorough experimentation with that. Um, I know a lot of people have been doing things like that because the difference, so Dali, Mid Journey, Stable Diffusion, they're kind of good in they're better than each other in various different ways. So people have been doing things like, um, I don't really know the order because I haven't followed it too much, but for example, create, a, put a prompt into one thing, create it with that, and then take the output of that, put it into say stable diffusion. Um, and that way you get, because some of the models don't have a very good quote unquote imagination. For example, I remember one example online, it was something like, squids packing boxes at an Amazon warehouse. And you put it in one of the models and it doesn't really do it well. You, you, it just gets a random tentacles, but you put it into another model and you get a pretty good representation of a squid pack packing boxes, but the image quality isn't very good. But then if you take that image, you put it into another model, um, you give it the same prompt. This time that model, which wasn't very good to begin with, has a good starting base and it's able to produce a better quality image of that prompt. So people are experimenting with these kind of things. Um, I myself haven't gone there yet. Regarding your second question, this is a really big uh, point of concern really, because as I was saying, as we all know, I mean, these systems can generate so much content that it's plausible that in the near future, most of the content online will be AI generated. And it's not always very easy to distinguish AI generated from human generated. And so then the future models, will, uh, which are being trained on content on the internet are going to be trained on AI generated content. And this is going to create these kind of feedback loops. Um, in fact, I remember watching uh, a previous digital futures and it's like in architecture everyone's Zaha Hadid, Zaha Hadid this and it's like all the AI generated content for architecture is Zaha Hadid and that's just going to go into a feedback loop um, which is also a major point of view. This is the kind of stuff I'm thinking about when I'm talking about in 20 years time if our kids grow up in VR with everything's being generated in real time in response to their galvanic biometric response things could become very homogenous. If we look at our pop music and Hollywood today, it's incredibly homogenous. So I am kind of expecting, um, yeah, such, that. One thing that happens in Dali when you do outpainting, when you start outpaint too much, you start losing quality and you have to input again another image. It's kind of, a, a, we can relate it to our imagination maybe. It's kind of losing things like gets like too blank or too, dull you know that's what I, I was a little bit afraid of i keep thinking of that we could lose something in that process and i should underline that um again going back to, with this question and linking with neil's previous question i have no doubt 
I'm not suggesting that art is dead, imagination is dead. Um, rather, I'm concentrating on the fact that, again, that metaphor is how I think about it. Today, we have the strongest, fittest people alive today. We have super athletes, we have superhuman athletes, but the majority of the population, or at least half, is obese. So that's kind of what I'm thinking might be a potential future. We have an elite group of superhuman, creative, imaginative people who are using these systems to fully explore the space of possibilities, while most people will become the equivalent of imagination obese. I mean, that doesn't make sense. I mean, that means a lot of imagination, but like the, the equivalent of Go. that. Yeah. Go. Yeah. Imagination, though, like just blank. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, exactly. Because they don't need to imagine anything. I mean, yeah. um, kids have great imagination. They play with cars and they're imagining whole universes. But what if they don't have to imagine whole universes? What if they live in a VR where everything is being imagined exactly for them? Um, but yeah. Uh, okay. Lazy brains. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. I, I kind of there's there's a risk that you end up being a little bit conservative in memo because I think the the, the Prince Charles has got this, this, the, there's a, there's a slight risk of your you, it comes across in a conservative way I know you don't need this but I mean in a way um, uh, Prince Charles I always think would, would would kind of criticize the contemporary age of Beavis and Butthead television viewers you know they can't spell they can't add up they can't do this but they can do other things they say multitask and so on so. Maybe we just accept it. We just evolve and and, and, and see what. See I'm what a Beavis happens. and Butthead kid. I mean, come on, Beavis and Butthead rules. <laughs> okay. Um, so I know, uh, I know, I know, I completely know what you mean, and I am asking myself this: Am I just a grumpy old man? Right. Uh, I'm, am I just a grumpy old man who who hates the future? Um, but on the other hand, we are on the threat of a nuclear war. Like, so I'm not saying this is what is going to happen. I'm just trying to imagine, again, if you pardon the pun, potential futures. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. So we've got, we've got a bunch of questions. We've got several in the chat. Um, uh, Dan, I'll just have to do them in order. We've got Daniela. Um, we've got Yiguo. Uh, Osge from the chat. We've got uh, Michael Justus just sent some in as well. So let's go in that order, um, first of all. So, Daniela, would you like to uh, ask your question? Sure, thank you. And thank you very much, Neil. And thank you so much for that mind blowing presentation. Like really, I'm kind of flying the plane as I build it here with my question. And I just want to preface it. First of all, my research has been heavily in the area of blockchain and metaverses, something that I call cyber urban incubators in the blockchain metaverse. Um, and the metaverse is kind of a stand up, uh, sandbox for a startup society. And I'm actually involved in the project that is a metaverse for a startup society. Um, so I'm very fascinated by the hive mind of Discord and this decision to put Midjourney on Discord. I love that. Um, and I'm coming at this from an architect's perspective. Um, and I'm asking the question, what does it mean for social systems and cooperation to be on blockchain? And you touched on this very lightly in the very beginning and how blockchain could possibly merge uh, with artificial intelligence and accelerate the intelligence of social systems. Um, so that we have things like um, decentralization of societies through DAOs, um, uh, organizations that kind of pop up in a distributed fashion all over the world um, and form distributed autonomous organizations on the blockchain. Um, and that's very much correlated to the metaverse. But um, my question, to you really has to do with these distributed affiliations in relationship to questions that you raised about consciousness and about creativity and about kind of the acceleration of our productivity. Um, so I'm not sure if you can address a little bit about how blockchain kind of gets into that. Sure, yeah, that's, that's a great question. So I, I should say, I don't personally have a lot of experience with DAOs. Um, I, I mean, I familiar with what they are, but I don't have a lot of in-depth personal experience. And I find that generally having a lot of personal experience gives you lots of different perspectives that you don't get. So for example, I started doing NFTs and just the act of engaging in NFTs um, gave me many perspectives that I would not have had if I wasn't 
in that world. Um, with DAOs, I don't have that. I will say this though, and it also links to the general theme of what I'm talking about with, with regards to the, the general AI, creative AI technologies. And that is, it's dif difficult to distinguish between the kind of raw technology as it is and the the culture and the societal values that that technology lives in. In fact, this is what Ursula Franklin calls the real world of technology. She argues very much against the idea of even thinking of a tech as a technology as a device, uh, but rather the set of values that gave rise to that technology and the set of values and norms that allow that technology to happen. So with blockchains, for example, I, I think blockchains are an incredible, amazing technology. For example, to think about transnational, in particular transnational modes of governance or access to natural resources. So for example, you know, I, I'm from Turkey and I've been, I've been living in Turkey for a few years. And unfortunately there's always tensions between Turkey and Greece neighbors, and there's like lots of natural, um, natural gas resources found and again, the two countries were almost at war over these natural resources. And it's like, again, humans are not clever enough because if you were clever enough, we would find a way of using natural resources without having to go to war. Um, and I think, for example, blockchains could be a potential way of navigating this space of accessing and using natural resources, but on a global scale without individual countries owning those natural resources. But instead, what did we use blockchains for? To sell apes JPEGs. So this is, I think, the biggest issue around these technologies. It's not what can the technology do, but what is more likely to happen. And also bringing it back to the AI debate, I think this is What's happening in creative AI is fascinating. It's amazing. But given the trend that we're on, um, what I imagine is going to happen is profit maximizing companies like Meta, like Google, they're going to be devising systems that might not be best for the, the individual. Um, so, yeah, as I said, I don't have a lot of hands-on experience with DAO, so I can't really, I don't have any more insightful perspectives on that. But this is what I'm thinking around blockchains basically that it is a potential incredible technology um i just hope it does get put to use in a way that can be beneficial um but i'm not sure how that will happen i just want to add one footnote and i'll make it very quick so a lot of the blockchain project has to do with owning your data and keeping your data across platforms and not having it collected by some company um, but the other thing there's an incredible kind of uh, thesis out there called the network states by Balaji Srinivasan. And um, the idea is that people form these organizations and they are distributed across the globe and they sort of become a distributed society that eventually can kind of link up their individual or collective real properties and uh, even vie for like nationhood. And I find this really interesting because the DAO is really kind of a system of allowing, you know, the community to kind of vote on how they want the community to grow or what they want to happen. But I'll, I'll hand over the mic to someone else. Thank you very much for this absolutely amazing uh, lecture. Oh, thank you very much. Thanks, Tanya. So we've got a whole bunch of questions out. So um, uh, Yiguo is next. Then I'm going to go to the to the chat for a few. Then we'll come back to Barack and 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 Deepti. So uh, Yiguo, would like to ask ask your question? Yeah, I have a question for Memo. So you were mentioned as your presentations and how making people feel happy and how the human settlement can improve the sense of the happiness for people, not stressing people, as people recently cannot uh, afford the house as many um, placed as that situation. That kind of philosophical question, 
as that also concerns my PhD research at post person. So I believe that that's kind of questions which AI cannot answer. Maybe AI will help. I think maybe we'll have the capitalist increased the price of the house because the major immigration because more you know more beautiful and more 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 the aesthetic improved right and the meantime AI seems is also lead the rapid change of lifestyle cultural form productive service even the systems of po political and economical system so my question would be like how to adopt the AI program to establish the uh, intimate relationship with the physical forms of architecture or urban space. Okay, that's a very interesting question. So, uh, um, let me just think. So, what uh, do you mean on a technical level, or, or more on a um, kind of practical level, or like a creative level? Did you mean? Yeah, yeah. How to achieve like a practical resource, as in our real life, in a real human settlement community, like that way. Yeah. Okay, so one thing I often think about is that the things that we expect will happen or hope to happen are not necessarily the things that will happen. Uh, and instead, there'll be a lot of unexpected things that are happening. And we can see this kind of in the history of sci-fi and futuristic predictions, where if you look at what people were predicting in the early 1900s, um, the, their space of imagination is so limited that they were imagining things that didn't happen, um, like people flying with flapping wings on their back or even flying cars, but instead we have completely different things. And so I think even what's happening now with these text to image models, I don't know if people were expecting this. You were expecting different kinds of creative AI tools, but we got this. So I think that's going to happen again when it comes to kind of urban planning and architecture and the way we live in cities, etc. This is why I generally have tried to avoid making predictions. Um, I, I hate to say I'm not very optimistic about certain aspects of the future with regards to AI. Um, and I don't mean for like robot takeover kind of things, but more just looking at the trend of where we are, business, profit maximizing. Um, I'm not an anti-capitalist, but I'd like to see capitalism paired with some kind of ethics. Whereas the yeah. system we have basically rewards psychopaths. Um, so the more psychopathic you are, um, I mean, you either, if you don't have any opportunities, you become a murderer, you go to jail, but if you do have opportunities, you become a CEO. So um, of a major large company. And because of that, most of my realistic predictions are not very beneficial for the individual. Um, mm. So if you're asking me how could it have been if we had uh, benevolent rulers and benevolent companies? That's a very different question to how do I think it is going to be? How I think it is going to be is that privacy in all its forms is going to completely go away. There's going to be no such thing as privacy um, because there will be ways of extracting information from all kinds of data from the way you walk even you know, already we have gait analysis and things like that so the way you walk down the street um, everything will be correlated with everything each other and there'll be models of what you think and where you go and what you do that's what i think is going to happen what i would have liked to see and this does go back to the previous question with regards to owning your own data um I think it is incredibly powerful and potentially beneficial that these technologies could give us. Just to give an example, uh, this is a bit of a digression, but I think it underlines what I'm trying to say. Like I have a smartwatch and it knows what I eat. It knows how much I sleep. Um, 
it knows everything I do and it tells me every day what how, what exercise to do. It tells me, okay, you've had six hours of sleep, you've eaten this much, you should run, um, you know, do a 10 minute warm up run at this pace and then run for 43 minutes at this pace, this, that, the other. And I love this. Um, and I want more. I want nanobots in my body doing real time analysis of my lactate thresholds, of my uh, pre like everything. And I want to see it all real time so I can be the best superhuman, that, the best human that I could be. I want this. Um, but I don't want Facebook to have access to this data so that they can manipulate me. Um, and I think this is the biggest problem uh, that we should try and address um, how do we reap the benefits of this um, without losing and this is why going back to what Neil was saying that I, I you know I'm a grumpy old man it's not that I'm just trying to be dystopian I'm just trying to think how do we maximize the benefits while minimizing the negatives that's really um, I don't know if that answers your question I didn't really get into architecture because it's not really my domain but that's my general view on this. Yeah, it's an interesting point. Thank you very much. Thanks, Adam. Um, I'm just an optimist, Adam. I'm just an optimist. I think that's probably the way, rather than being a pessimist. Um, we, just, I wanted to simply just mention where these questions have been coming from. Angelica is in, was in, is in Brazil. Uh, um, uh, Daniela is in I think, Chicago. Uh, Yi Guo is in Italy. She's a Chinese PhD student there. And I want to invite uh, Oskar uh, Gonluga, who is an, um, uh, a, a Turkish uh, student in a uh, moment in Barcelona, to um, ask a question. Oskar. Thank you so much for this mind-loving presentation, Memo. It was really inspiring. Um, yeah. So my question is that it's regarding the genetic genetic manipulations and integrating of AI into evolutionary process in terms of creating co-evolutionary processes with AI and nature itself. So maybe it's like a kind of like future theory right now, but in potential features, do you think that would it be possible to somehow combine genetic coding and AI and next generation sequencing together and what kind of potential features and applications would this field have? So yeah, that's, that's also a great question. I mean, I am not a genetic molecular biologist, so I can't really comment on what I think is feasible, but I will say this, um, Craig Venture, for example, famously who amongst many other things was, you know, his institute was the, Institute that created Cynthia, the, the first artificial life form, artificial in the sense that its DNA was basically 3D printed um, and then booted up in, a, in, a, in an empty um, microbe shell. Again, I'm not a biologist, but this is my understanding of it. He's also the first to sequence the human DNA, etc. So he's been working on this problem of genome, pheno, genome to phenome mapping, uh, genotype to phenotype mapping. So given a sequence of nucleotide pairs, how does that map to physical characteristics? Of course, this is a very, very difficult problem because it's not as simple as just the sequence of nucleotide pairs, the environment and how that environment changes and everything about that environment, the nutrients, the temperature, the acidity, everything is key in how that mapping takes place. So it's by no means an easy problem. Nevertheless, if it is possible, then it's going to happen with AI. So that's that's my my take on it. Like, I I'm not a I'm not in the position to say yes, this will be addressed, this will be done. All I can say is, if humanity is ever going to be able to do this, it will happen via AI, and I via I don't want to say AI via big data driven methods. So the flavor of AI that we have right now is called deep learning, and whether deep learning is the future or not, it probably isn't. It's descendants will be but overall we can think of these methods as big data driven methods so methods that learn to extract some kind of meaningful information from big data and of course on one hand i think this is incredibly um a good thing if we can use it to cure leukemia cure alzheimer's and basically there are certain things that you know i'm not necessarily um a 
transhumanist who believes that humans should live forever. But I, because there are a lot of people who do believe that, who are trying to reverse death. But I do believe that while we are alive, we should have a decent quality of life. Um, and so diseases like leukemia, Alzheimer's, really, I'd be happy for them to just disappear off the face of the planet. Um, on the other hand, very, very speculative. Uh, this is, I'm not suggesting this will happen, but I love thinking of the idea that one day we might be able to photosynthesize. So I'm not just a pessimist, Neil. I am optimistic. I'm super optimist. Like imagine if you could just lie in the sun and it feels, you get the joy of eating a delicious meal and that's how you get your energy. Um, I don't think it will happen, but I like speculating about it. On the flip side of the coin, um, imagine a future where we can design babies with an IQ of 300. Um, and imagine that this is a service that is very expensive so that only a select few people can have 300 IQ babies. So this will literally create a branch in the evolution of human species. I keep thinking of H.G. Wells's time machine. Um, with the Eloy and the Morlocks, like humanity diverges into different species. Um, I think that was such a great, um, I don't want to say prediction because we don't know if it's happened, but it was a really, really nice piece of speculative fiction. Um, so these are some of my thoughts around that. I, I think it's definitely happening. I mean, it is happening. Craig Ventures Institute is working on this. Loads of startups are working on this. Coupled with things like CRISPR, gene editing technology, uh, it could become a thing of reality. I should mention that Oscar is actually was a biologist in her first degree and since begun, done the biodigital program in, uh, in Barcelona. Um, so we have a couple of chats. What, what is it? Uh, let me ask a question from the chat first of all, and then we'll go to Barack and Deepti. Um, this is from uh, Vasco, who's in Bangladesh, and he's there's a lot of noise in the background, so you asked me to read it out for you. It's a question in the chat, and you can see it yourself, as it were. Unless you want to ask it, uh, Vasco, I can see you now. Do you want to? No, okay. Um, uh, okay, so uh, his question is, um, earlier AI did, was designed for few objectives, defining some, uh, for, defined for some purpose, like AlphaGo was programmed to play Go and given an objective to winning the game, but it is too limiting. If AI can be designed for want to learn with intrinsic motivation for knowledge exploration and exploitation of knowledge, can we uh, then can, can we can explicate the so-called word supernatural? What is your opinion? Um, yeah, this is a great question. So this is very, it's a very correct observation and it has always been a point of discussion um, that obviously we have these what so-called narrow AI and there is this end goal of human level intelligence or our AGI, our still general intelligence. In between that, so AGI is human-like AI. Um, but before we get to that, in between that is what I've always been referring to general purpose learning algorithms. Um, and general purpose learning algorithms, I think are quite exciting and we're moving in that direction. And what I just want, I want to expand on that is that you're right, we would design uh, an, an algorithm to play Go. We would design an algorithm to play chess. We would design an algorithm to play, or a learning algorithm, uh, an architecture to, to do this task. We would have a particular architecture to process images, a different architecture to process um, sound, a different architecture to process text. And this is how it's been, but a general purpose general purpose learning algorithm would be one that is able to handle all of these. If you look at the neocortex, the mammalian neocortex, which is um, generally thought to be the, the kind of seat of intelligence, at least for mammals, it's very kind of the same structure throughout the whole neocortex. Even though we have a visual cortex here at the back, we have the auditory cortex here on the side, the auditory cortex processes audio, visual cortex processes signal from the eyes, but actually they're very similar in structure. And in fact, people who don't have vision, their auditory cortex expands to include what should have been, what would have been the visual cortex. So the computation that is performed by the neocortex is general. In fact, I believe you had, um, you might've had, you had Jeff Hawkins on a previous 
uh, session and you know, he spoke all about this, so I won't go into that. And what's happening now in AIAG with like transformers, it's moving towards a step where we're able to use transformers to do both images and sound and text. Even though it's not general purpose learning yet, we're moving in that direction. And a lot of the work that um, DeepMind in particular, which are apart from Numenta, which is Jeff Hawkins's research, which I, I really like what they're doing. DeepMind are probably one of the more interesting AI research labs that are looking at kind of more general intelligence. So they have Alpha Zero, which can play chess and go and do other things. And now they even use, so this is really new. This was on the cover of Nature just a few days ago. They even used Alpha Zero to optimize an algorithm. They um, basically have a matrix multiplication. When you multiply two large matrices, there's loads and loads of multiplications and additions that are going on. And there was an algorithm that's been used since 1969 to do this most efficiently. And in 50 years, 53 years, that's been the best algorithm. Alpha Zero found a more optimal way of doing this multiplication. And now this has impact on everything. Everything that uses matrix multiplications will be optimized because of this. So that's the kind of first part of your question with general purpose learning algorithms. The second part with regards to intrinsic motivation, this is one of the big open questions with regards to um, if you design an agent, how what kind of goal do you give it? Um, you know, with AlphaGo, AlphaZero, okay, it's a common architecture, but you still give it the goal. Okay, this architecture, learn to play chess. This architecture, learn to play Go. Um, what kind of intrinsic motivation would should you give an agent so that it can just, like a human, go out in the world and explore? There's a few theories. Um, Jürgen Schmidhuber has a, the, the, the German... AI researcher who's not as famous as like people like Jeff Inton or Jan Nakun in the mainstream, but he's one of the really key pioneers. So he has a theory around curiosity and um, around curiosity, which is a kind of obvious idea, but he has a mathematical formulation where he proposes that the goal of an agent, and this is quite a, there's a nuance here, should be to increase, maximize the derivative Hang on, of the derivative of compression. Um, what he means by that is that you want to improve your compressor. Your compressor is the your ability to observe the world and then build the model of it and compress it. The more you can compress what you observe, that means the more you have understood it. And we can see this in, for example, the way the models of the solar systems have evolved, like in the... Um, in the geocentric model to explain the observations, you need to very have you need a very complex model because it, the Earth at the center is a lot of epicycles, etc. And then you have the Copernican model, then you have the Kepler model with the ellipses, and that it, this, the planets sweep an equal amount of area per time. So this is you're improving your model, you're making it smaller. And then we have Newton's laws, which are making it even smaller. Then you have general relativity, which is making it even smaller. Even though general relativity is a more complex model than Newton's laws, it explains more. So overall, you need less to explain all the phenomena that you observe. So an agent, an intelligent agent, should seek to maximize the improving of their model, of their compressor. So this means if they sit in a corner of the room, they're not improving. They have to go out into the world, make observations, and be able to improve. This is one. Um, there's lots of different models. There's one based on information theory, which is that an agent would want to, let me see if I can express this right. The agent should want to maximize its ability to make an impact on the world. So the actions that it takes has a big impact in a way that it can predict. And there's an information theoretical approach to that. So these are, it's a fascinating world. So that's the second part of your question. With regards to explicating the so-called word supernatural, I don't fully understand that part of your question, to be honest. You're muted. Um, can you unmute yourself, uh, Vasco, or maybe type your thing in the, in the chat. That uh, might be an easy way of doing it. Um, uh, So 
So, um, that might take a while. <laughs> maybe that wasn't such a good idea. Um, but um, maybe we can come back to it in a moment because we've got a lot of other questions that are coming in. Um, uh, Barak is, so, so Vasco is in, in Bangladesh. Barak is in Japan and uh, he's the one who used to work for, um, uh, what well, is interactive design. Barak, do you want to ask your question? Team Lab. Yeah. Yes, Memo. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, it's fascinating. I've been, I'm a fan of your work for a long time and it's interesting to see uh, I saw your presentation at ITP at NYU a few years back when you were at Goldsmith, I think, um, and really fascinating to see the trajectory. Uh, you touched on a few interesting points that of sort of the the shifting relationship with technology, I think societally, also for creative practitioners and artists in particular, uh, from the accelerating rate of change of different creative technologies and technologies in general, um, and of um, AI technologies in, in what you've presented, but also the impact on attention spans, the asymmetries of AI, and uh, particularly in relation to who controls the technology mm -hmm. um, and what their intention and what the technology is deployed to do. Um, specifically from, I guess, the perspective of a creative technologist or a media artist, or uh, I don't know if, uh, you know, how you would classify yourself I'm interested in, in your perspective of the change of your practice and how do you think our relationship to technology is changing sort of in that in that reference going from maybe, you know, uh, when there's a new maybe hardware device or a library and the sort of mastery of the of the new canvas or the, of the new craft is is breaking it open and voiding the warranty and figuring how it works and making turning it into something creative uh, into a sort of technological landscape that seems to become ever more uh, obfuscated and ever more complex and the opportunity to actually tinker and hack is becoming uh, reserved to a to a limit to obviously the people who are building it but from a creative or a subversive aspect it's becoming less and less possible or requires more and more uh, understanding of not only the code but all of the underlying models because the algorithms are less um, clear or less linear mm -hmm. okay yeah that's a very interesting question so i mean there's there's a lot in there i mean with regards to my practice kind of changing or evolving there's obviously a few reasons. One is I'm getting older. As I get older, you know, I my interests change, evolve, and my outlook changes and evolves a little bit. That's one. Two, the world is changing, um, not just uh, the technologies, but the kind of the values and the trends um, are changing. I mean, I've been kind of doing this kind of stuff since the 90s basically so obviously there's there's been a lot going a lot happening in that in that time in the world politically and socially outside of just the technologies but the observation you make about the technologies is very true i, I think about this a lot um until pretty much until transforms came along in 2017 um you could train a model from scratch on a home computer uh you could you could pretty much replicate the state of the art on a decent gaming computer uh it might take months if you had one gpu but but you could do it but now um now that's just not possible now uh, an individual an independent researcher cannot afford the hardware can't access the i mean can't really access the data i mean um it's it's becoming a thing which only companies can do and this is really interesting because throughout my phd i could always play with state-of-the-art architecture i could train and, and i could replicate i could replicate state-of-the-art um, now obviously i can't i can't train gpt i mean gpt3 is old news i i can't train a lambda i don't even have access to, to the uh, Lambda is Google's model. So this puts us in a very interesting position. And I was kind of referencing that in, in one of my um, bullet points of like, it's becoming very centralized. There is stable diffusion, uh, which is an open source, this, you know, this open source thing. And the, you know, the, the founder, um, Emad, 
I don't know him personally, but just following him on Twitter, he sounds like he's either an angel or a Bond villain. Um, I, I don't know which one yet, but but his his mission um, appears to be to, to, to democratize this and to just make it public. The models are public. Everything about it is public, uh, which I think is I think it's a great move. It, it has some downsides to some degree. It's quite accelerationist in the sense that um, while things like Mid Journey and Dali are closed, you can only access it through their website. This means that they can block things like deep fake porn from happening. Whereas with this with stable diffusion being fully open source, you think, hey, that's great. But now there's a lot of deep fake porn popping up because anybody can run it. So it's very accelerationist in that sense. Personally, I lean towards that direction, as in I like the fact that it's all open. Um, but yeah, the long term projection of this is, again, we are going to be at the mercy of these big companies because they're the ones developing it. Individuals cannot do anything other than what the companies allow them to do. Um, does that address your question or did I miss anything? If I can, yeah, if I can quickly follow up on that, because yeah. I think th there's another aspect that I would love to get your thoughts on. You mentioned that you could train a network on your personal computer, and I think you could also reason about it. So if I'm, if I think about the very early sort of neural networks that, I mean, at least that's how I started learning about neural networks. I don't know if that's still the case. You build MNIST and you detect handwritten digits. And if you look through what's going on you can you can make sense of how it works uh of sort of the the dimensionality reduction and ending up with which is the digit i can think through the process where i don't know if i could do that for understanding fully what uh, uh dali does without being an expert so the the space of possibility of who can tinker and who can hack aside from the fact that the technology in open is open source and that's great and i but also who is able to then contribute or manipulate and not just be a user or, you know, create different interfaces and what that means about who directs technology, even if it's open source. Yes, yes, I see. So that, that's a very good point as well. I mean, an interesting thing I should mention is, I don't think MNIST is used anymore, by the way, but yeah, for, for a while it was like the hello world of, of, of neural networks or even before neural networks of machine learning in general. So one interesting thing is with MNIST, with a very small convolutional net, um, like Linet 5, like a very small convnet, I could, as you say, understand how it worked, like fully understand how this image would be classified. Like I could almost visualize the flow of information and see the output. Um, with image nets, so still the convolutional neural network, but working on photographs of like cats and dogs. And like mm -hmm. I, in 2012, when that, breakthrough came came through at with AlexNet, I couldn't conceive how a neural network could do could do that. I mean mathematically I knew how it was working, but I just like how is that even possible that an image that complex could just go into a neural network and just through these layers this output would come. And I, I just couldn't conceive it. But working with Convnet somehow I don't know how long it took, but it kind of became very natural that yeah, obviously you can do that. Like it, it I, I internalized and I normalized that understanding. Um, when these Dali type things come out, I, I had re again had that same reaction of like, um, how on earth is this possible? Like you type in, you know, a squirrel wearing an avocado surfing on a wave made out of gold on the moon, and it does it, and. And it's just through gradient descent, effectively, through gradient descent, it's learning a function that is, allows it to do this. Um, that really blew my mind and still is to some degree. You're very right that very few people can probably visualize this process to the degree that they understand it really well. But really, um, it is a black box inside a black box inside a black box inside a black box. And that's what's to some degree allowing it to do what it is able to do. If we could understand how it did what it did, then it wouldn't be able to do things that we can't do. Um, that's not entirely true because we can learn from it. Like one of the amazing things of AlphaGo was that in playing AlphaGo, 
um, I believe Lee Sedol was able to improve his playing dramatically. So a lot of Go players have learned from AlphaGo. And I think this is amazing. This is an incredible thing that we are actually bettering ourselves permanently through interacting with these machines. But yes, in terms of understanding, reasoning, that's a big open area of research. You know, it's called understandable AI or you know, um, interpretable AI, how to make these things actually explain to you why it's doing the things it's doing. Um, but yeah, we're not there yet. Definitely transformers. It's, yeah, it's quite crazy how well it works and how close it is to a lot of us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've got um, three questions here in the Zoom, but I want to ask this. The, the people have been waiting in, in the chat for some time. There are two questions. One is from uh, Michael Just or Michael Just Studio. Um, uh, um, hi, Memo, and thank, thank you for the wonderful lecture. Given that you brought up the, so to speak, decentralized mind and or intelligence of cephalopods, um, I was thinking about some research that is currently being done on self-organizing. One could probably say bio-inspired models of neural networks that would not be based on a centralized optimization algorithm such as gradient descent. Uh, in brackets, take neural cellular automata, for instance. I find this approach fascinating, but I also wonder if, like bio-inspired chips, there might be a substantial there might be substantial challenges in the way. Have you thought about this? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I. I'm fascinated by these topics. Um, it's not really my area of expertise. Um, I think there's also connections with this between what Neil was mentioning at the start around homeostasis. I mean, biology is all about, or, or nature, the natural world is about, it's fully decentralized and um, systems optimize themselves kind of naturally. There's an amazing talk. Actually, he'd be a great person to have on, on this thing. And Michael Levin, he's, he's, a, he's a biologist and he studies, he studies a lot of things, but in particular, he's given talks around intelligence on nat in nature in single-celled organisms. So he gave a talk at NeurIPS, um, the major AI conference, quite a few years ago. I think it was something like intelligence without a nervous system and he goes through the intelligence exhibited by single-celled organisms that that don't even have nervous systems obviously slime mold is a very classic example but he goes through lots and lots of examples one big question obviously is gradient descent essential to my knowledge right now we don't actually know how the brain learns um, as in I, I, on a kind of low mechanistic level. Maybe we do, but I, I don't know that we do know. I know that some people have said, could it be gradient, something like gradient descent? Other people have said no. So clearly there are ways, alternative gradient descent. And prior to gradient descent, many people have tried many different ways. Um, but it just turns out, at least computationally, with the architectures that we have, gradient descent does work. Um, I am not in a position to suggest any alternatives uh, that might be better or more robust, but definitely I think it's a really fascinating um, topic. Again, Jeff Hawkins is, you know, they're not using gradient descent, they're using their whole own um, hierarchical temporal memory and sparse distributed representations. They have a whole other way of, of learning, of updating the model. Um, I'm just keen to observe how that pans out. Okay, there's um, this uh, uh, Robotron 55,000 uh, in the chat here. Um, uh, hello, Memo. Um, uh, your your uh, thought work and insights are an inspiration. Can you expand on a thought you shared about the difference between mechanical stroke robotic AI and software AI? There seems to be an intrinsic thinking that the, the, the creative skill is simply the generation of the idea. What of the execution stroke realization stroke actualization? There seems to be an extraordinary possibility as the moderator is indicating of an overall amplification of creativity. Okay, yeah. So, I mean, regarding the, the robotic and software, I, I was simply referring to the fact that the, you know, a robot has to move in the real world. And, there's a lot of constraints imposed upon it 
due to the physics of moving around in the world, due to the physical materials, etc. So designing robots that are able to have the dexterity to kind of pick things up like this and move around is has to solve that task. I mean, the joints, the hands, the body is, is an incredible, incredible machine, which any roboticist will, you know, can tell you that, you know, this is just, it's a mind blowing thing, all of the way these joints, et cetera, work. So that's what I was referring to, that a robot would have to solve those problems. In factories, it's okay, because robots are programmed to do very particular tasks, but more for more general tasks, you would need a more general body. And, and that's the challenge. Um, they seem to be interested in thinking that the creative school is simply the generation of the idea. Um, I'm not sure I fully understand that sentence. I mean, the creative skill is the generation of, of something, whether it's the idea, whether it's an image, whether it's, you know, a piece of music. So um, in the case of, you know, here I was referring to the software like Midjourney, Dali, and the later 3D movement uh, software, they're generating something that stays virtual. So there's data in the virtual world, and the output is also stays in the virtual world. So the human becomes the interface between getting the data from the outside world into the software and then getting the thing back. So yeah, I'm not fully sure there. What is the execution realization? Act what of the execution realization actualization? There seems to be extraordinary possibility as a model of an overall amplification of creativity. So there definitely is, as I said, a massive amplification of creativity, like for myself. I mean, yeah, the, I there is a huge, huge amplification of creativity. As, as I said, I've generated tens of thousands of images just in this last, like more than I have in, in my life. So, I mean, there is no doubt in the amplification of creativity. Um, I wonder, again, if, if this is a, in response to my final point, that was more in regards to, I wonder what is the long-term effects in 20 years if we live through 20 years of this, including kids growing up in these environments, what happens to their development of their minds if you then later remove access to this technology? So that was my question with regards to the amplification versus removal. Today, there, there should be no doubt, creativity and my imagination internally, not just with the system, internally my imagination is amplifying beyond comprehension because I have so much material to feed myself. It's a bit like Lee Sedol playing AlphaGo to better himself at Go. That's what's happening to my mind right now. There is no doubt about that. You've got that Sorry, I was just saying, does that, is that, well, does that answer your question? Uh, this was a question in the chat, right? Um, yeah. So I don't know if we'll get a response in a moment. Um, yes. Um, okay. So we got. Uh, I don't, don't want to take your time, memo, but you, you've you've got a lot of questions because it was such a, an amazing, provocative talk. We've got three. I don't have got time for three um, in the in the Zoom chat I'm, here. There's one. I'm having a great time. So I'm okay. Happy. All right. So let's go with Felice. Felice is actually in Miami. She's a graduate at Harvard GSD. She's uh, on the uh, the FIUD Des. Um, Felice. Yeah, hi, Mimo. Great, great, great presentation. Thank you. Um, something you were beginning to tease out that uh, I would like you to tease out more if you could a little bit, um, which is, I mean, you mentioned one of your concerns was the exploitation and centralization of tech and these and these platforms, I'm assuming. Um, you know, it, it, it does in a way capitalize, no pun intended, on, on the kind of process of individuation, individualization, you know, individuation, I should say. Um, so that that in a way is very different than your idea of kind of distributed, uh, you know, system or kind of a distributed emancipatory idea, perhaps, which I find really amazing. Um, so you mentioned Zoom is great. And, you know, these sort of partitioning type of, of spaces. And you said we're not so great when it comes to larger kind of uh, societal. We're, we're not intelligent, essentially. I mean, I'm wondering if that kind of intelligence that you're you're kind of speaking about is something emergent or something that has to become emergent for this to become more uh, emancipatory. So I was wondering if you could tease that out a little bit from your own perspective. And thank you. 
Okay, yeah, very, very interesting questions. I mean, I guess I don't really have very concrete answers to this, but just thinking about it a bit more, on one hand, um, we, you know, we love heroes. You know, they, you know, Campbell's hero with a thousand faces kind of covers the history of covers our history of how um, committed to heroes we are. So that's kind of part of a, I'm going to make a, a kind of assumption slash assertion that I guess that's part of our DNA to some degree. Um, I presume we somehow evolved to uh, idolize heroes. Um, and that's why the, this, we also have artists, like the, the, the artists, the, the heroes, you know, Van Gogh or, you know, Rembrandt. We, we love thinking about these amazing people um, in, the art, in the art world as well. And then that is becoming at odds increasingly with the way we are making things. And, and this is really the point I was trying to highlight. And I, I love the fact that Mid Journey in particular is really a provocation explicitly in putting it on discord and making everything public and that you can you, you can literally if you see a nice image you can just literally click variations and make variations of it so you, you branch out so we're really losing this sense of authorship which in a way um like i feel really connected to the works that i made but i have to acknowledge that you know it, it is a creation of everyone somehow but we don't really even have a language to talk about this. That's what I find interesting. We don't have a language to talk about this. We don't have a, a system in place to distribute uh, and acknowledge the different levels of participation. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing is with regards to the collective intelligence. I mean, this might be quite a fatalistic view, a fatistic, I don't know what that word is, but anyway, we, you know, we didn't really evolve to live on a planetary scale. Uh, you know, we evolved in small tribes. So on maybe a small tribe level of population, we are maybe able to act intelligently in that think of what's best for the individual and for the tribe. But when scaled to a planetary scale, we, you know, we have the problems that we're having now. We have conflicts. And we haven't yet managed to find a way around that. We haven't managed to scale our intelligence, um, our social intelligence. And this I find quite interesting and not really spoken about enough. I think we always talk about human level intelligence. Let's get to human level intelligence. And it's like, well, humans can't get on with each other. We haven't found that solution. So that's really I, I don't really have an answer to this uh, I mean I'd love to hear more about this but I think this is something that I'd like to be explored a lot deeper how do we scale our social interactions to a global scale while still keeping it optimal for the well-being of humans and planet actually a key thing that comes up here is I just said optimal of course optimal with respect to what what is the goal and that's the issue that we can't agree collectively on what the goal is. Whereas in small groups, we can agree. We can agree the goal is to get this robot on that comet. And we 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 do it. It's amazing. We're super smart. But um, on a global scale, we can't agree on a goal. You'd think it would be easy, you know, no nuclear war, but um, but we we can't do it, I think. I don't know if that answers your question. Yes, it, it definitely addresses it. Thank you very much. Um, so let's, we have Deepti Dutt who is in India and your audience is all over the world today. Deepti, that's your question. Hi, Memo, that was a great presentation. Thank you so much, especially the second part where you were talking about your own uh, ideations and thoughts on what is happening. But my question is more regarding towards the first aspect of your presentation, which is distributed consciousness. So there was one place in this, as a part of this uh, conversation, you said, if we remove the machine, what is left? I thought that was extremely interesting. 
So even with the added lovelace that uh, engine has, the analytical engine has no pretension, so it can do whatever we order it to do. So now we are living in a world where, you know, we can be inside the virtual machine. The machine is thinking for us. It's able to perform intelligently based on a given set of criteria. And then we also most likely will have biometric inputs going further for it to create further. So from the point of view of consciousness and distributed consciousness, uh, what do you think is the purpose or is there any purpose and value to human motivation? And, you know, where do you think motivation itself appears uh, beyond suggestive agency? So when you started the octopus project, there was, uh, you were snorkeling, you saw there was a suggestive agency from the environment. But beyond that suggestive agency, you had an intrinsic motivation or, uh, you know, you were able to act upon that suggestive agency in your own particular way. So can you answer this with respect to consciousness or distributed consciousness in the study of you? Okay, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, people, so if you're asking with regards to motivation, um, people have, you know, very different motivations. Um, and I guess this kind of ties back to the previous question about, you know, intrinsic motivation. And so in my case, obviously, my motivation is is curiosity. That's kind of always a key motivation. And what is happening that I find really fascinating already with the internet. Um, actually, there's one line in, in the text, in the, um, in the manifesto that, uh, that I played, the excerpt from distributed consciousness. There's one line that was generated by GPT-3, which says the internet is not a bunch of computers connected to each other, but a bunch of human minds connected to each other. And I found that line incredible. And I searched for it, like, is this a quote from someone? You know, because it could be GPT-3 just quoting someone. And I searched online, I searched Google Books. Um, I couldn't find it as a quote. So it might be that GPT-3, maybe, I don't know, came up with that line. Um, and if it did, I think like, wow, that's just <laughs> incredible. Uh, but even if it didn't, whoever did say it, I think that's a beautiful line. The internet's not a bunch of computers connected to each other, but a bunch of human minds. So. Part of my thinking process is now informed by what everyone else on the internet is thinking. And I mean, even what we're doing right now, I mean, this has always happened. We have discussions and um, we are, I love the way uh, the neuroscientist Lisa Barrett, Lisa Feldman Barrett, or Lisa Feldman Barrett, I can't remember, expresses it. We're basically regulating each other's nervous systems. That's what she says. She says, as a social species, we regulate each other's nervous systems. and a lot of organisms do this, insects do it, they regulate each other's nervous systems through chemicals, humans regulate each other's nervous systems through words, through vibrations in the air. And so now with the internet, already our minds are connected to each other. So that becomes part of my mind in a way when I have access to all of these thoughts at the speed of light. The issue has been, um, the one of accessing the appropriate information that I need. I mean, we have Google search, but that's kind of not the same. What's happening when I'm interacting with these models is it's a different way of filtering and reorganizing the information that's out there. So if GPT-3 is trained on, I don't know, a billion texts, I don't know how much I'm making that number up. If it's trained on the text of a billion people, I am my mind is accessing the thoughts of those billions of people that are relevant to what I'm thinking about. Um, so this I think is huge. And this is why writing that manifesto with GPT-3 was eye-opening to me. It was like I was having a conversation with the greatest thinkers of all time um, in a weird kind of way, filtered through this machine. So that's kind of one part of it. And then again, with Discord, Discord and uh, Midjourney is bringing this into the kind of visual domain. So these are the kind of themes that are kind of going around in my head. I don't know if I was able to articulate it in a way that addresses your question, but um, I don't know. 
Uh, yeah, but mostly I think in the beginning of the presentation, Neil also mentioned Wittgenstein and his, what do you think of his uh, language game and what he says about language and how we define, give, give these definitions, which may not have to, uh, in essence, be the same word that we are, you know, for example, addressing it as. So with regard to Wittgenstein and what happens with GPT-3 and the whole entire data with respect to artificial intelligence, and we call, okay, this is a bunch of cats, cat images. So we organize this and tell the computer this is a cat or by playing chess, we say, okay, this is the king. And these are things that he speaks about in um, his book. So what do you think is the connection towards, you know, is it just a language game or is there something? So are, do we need to redefine what being human is if now we are having a mirror with the help of a machine that is saying, we can, I can do all these things? Yeah. So these are very, very good questions. Um, so there's many opinions on this. And, you know, many people will say, for example, for GPT-3, I mean, there's big debates on this between very, very distinguished professors who are arguing over this. So clearly there is no one objective answer, um, but I'll give you my opinion. But before that, I just want to paint the landscape. So on one side, people are arguing, I want to say people, very, very distinguished professors of AI and natural language understanding, et cetera, will say that something like GPT-3 is just trying to it's just been trained to guess a word given some other words. It has no idea of what it's saying. It doesn't understand anything. It's just a statistical inference machine that's trying to guess a word given some other words. And on the other end of the spectrum, I guess there's people who are saying, yes, it's understanding what it's saying. Um, I will, I'm not on the camp that it's just a statistical inference machine that's trying to guess a one word out of missing words. The reason I don't agree with that is because that is focusing only on the optimization function. Yes, the optimization function is finds the missing word out of these missing words, out of these given words. Um, but that is analogous to, in my mind to saying that humans optimization function was get better at making better babies. Yet somehow we invented the internet. We, we do poetry, we invent flying robots. So in order, to achieve that optimization function, we have built this, we have developed a brain which is capable of building these hierarchies of abstract concepts, which allow us to do all these things. Um, and I say this, obviously there's the big debate whether we are born, um, you know, tabula rasa, are, are we born knowing or, or do we learn everything? That doesn't actually, we don't even need an answer for that because if you believe in Darwinian evolution, we have learned everything. Some of it we learned in life, some of it we learned through evolution. Um, so, with these language models, coming back to that, I do believe that these language models have built, I, it's, you, I don't think you can deny this, they have built hierarchies of abstract concepts. They do have a lot of internal concepts and models of things that are beyond just guessing words at, in a um, given a bunch of words. They need those levels of these hierarchies of abstract concepts in able to be able to answer those questions. For example, a really good example that I saw on Twitter the other day, someone used this example to show that GPT-3 is really dumb. And the example is you ask who would win in a fight, a very strong ant or a weak elephant? Now, most humans would say a weak elephant would win in a fight, but GPT-3 says the very strong ant would, would win in a fight. So this researcher was saying, okay, GPT-3 has no understanding about anything. So I tried this and I asked in the real world, who would win in a fight, a very strong ant or a weak elephant? And it said in the real world, even if the elephant is very weak, but the ant is very strong, the weak elephant is still a lot stronger than the weak ant, so the weak elephant would win. And I asked, in a fantasy world, who would win in a fight, a very strong ant or a weak elephant? And he said, well, that depends. It depends on how strong the ant is and how weak the elephant is, because in a fantasy world, anything could happen. So clearly, context is key. We humans have an implicit context of real world, whereas GPT-3 doesn't have that implicit context, but if you give it the, con the context, it replies 
reasonably well. So I think these are really, really amazing results. Now, you could ask, well, does it understand? And understanding is a very vague concept. Well, it's not vague. It's uh, There's many different interpretations. But I think if we reformulate that question to remove a bit of ambiguity and ask, does it know that it understands? That's a different question. Because to know that it understands implies that it has a self-model. Does GPT-3 have a model of itself as an agent um, that is modeling these things in the environment with other agents? That I don't know. Um, that's the ultimate, you know, what Turing was trying to address in the imitation game to some degree. And the the kind of the news about, you know, Lambda being conscious emerged from this, you know, a, a few months ago where the Google researcher thought Lambda was conscious. I don't think that um, these language models do have a model of self that is in any way consistent across time in the way that animals have a model of self that's consistent across time. Uh, so yeah, that, that's what I would say. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's my thinking about this. I think they do. There are a lot more than just statistical inference machines that try to guess a word given a bunch of words. Because to be able to do that to the degree that they are able to do it, they have to build these models and abstract concepts and have an understanding of how those concepts relate to each other. Um, and that's basically, in my mind, what, what we do, um, albeit on a much, 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 much richer level and on a very in a very different way. Yeah, that was that was a great answer. So that is also saying towards a level of sentience, maybe. And yeah. what, what do you think of qualia? So just focusing on the level of sentience. Um, so Doug Hofstadter calls that the size of the soul. And, you know, he, he'll say things like, you know, a mosquito doesn't have, um, I mean, it, it, all, it, it comes back to the model of self. If, uh, you know, GPT-3 can be very, very intelligent, but if, and it might have an abstract, it might have a concept of the real world, the fantasy world. It has a concept of what an elephant is. It has a concept of strength. It has a concept of size. It, it knows these concepts, but does it know that it knows? For it to know that it knows, it needs to have a concept of an agent. It needs to have a concept of a self, and it needs to have a concept of itself as a self in this world. And it needs to have a concept of other selves in that world that model each other. As I was mentioning in that part of my talk where, um, you know, we evolved and your consciousness is my interface to you. So I don't necessarily believe that GPT-3 has reached that level where it even has a concept of itself as an agent. Um, it might do. I don't know. We can never know. Qualia is, of course, the hard problem um, as Chalmers put it, that's, uh, you know, I'm not committed to any particular um, hypothesis. I, I am a physicalist in the sense that I don't believe in a quote unquote supernatural soul, um, but I'm kind of torn. I'm a Bayesian, which means I basically believe I have, I maintain a distribution of beliefs over all possible and plausible hypotheses. So the computational model would be the one that I just described. You have a model of self, you have a model of agents, et cetera, et cetera. And that somehow computationally, um, qualia even emerges from the model of self, the information you feel. That's what information feels like. So this, the key thing here is that this is substrate independence in that it happens in the brain, the brain processes information and we feel the redness of red as opposed to just registering that it's red. And from the computational point of view, because computation is substrate independence, if you program that exact same algorithm on any hardware, including silicone, like my laptop, then it should also have the qualia of red. Um, I don't know about that. You know, an alternative hypothesis is, well, there's many, but one that I am not fully against might be plausible is the biological physicalism, which is that there's something about the biology 
of our brains that gives rise to qualia. Um, in a way, that is a bit panpsychist in the sense that I think it would require a consciousness kind of, or a qualia kind of feel to emanate throughout the universe, which I believe Chalmers himself maybe subscribes a little bit to that. I don't want to assert that. I'm not 100% sure, but I think he's a bit more on that side. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not committing to any one belief. I don't even know how people can commit to any one belief because there's just zero evidence either way. Um, but, yeah, those are my thoughts. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, I mean, remember, this is fantastic. We, I, we're, we're all reaching saturation point at this point. So, that if you could manage two more questions, that'd be, that'd be great. I don't know if you can. If you... Yeah, okay, let's do it. Yeah. Okay, so Zainab has, um, I think in Izmir, um, Zainab has a question. Oh, I was there for the yes, past. Yes, <laughs> Hello. Hello. Uh, thank you for this wonderful question, uh, presentation. It is so lovely to have you here. I do not have a clear question, but uh, throughout your presentation and with all these developments, I was thinking about intuition and intuitive decision making. Uh, as you mentioned, in a design process, I also mainly start with an image in my mind. Uh, I know what I want, I know how I want, or even I feel true, but uh, or, or sometimes um, this process may be so much more painful for me, like getting away to my imagination or starting with Nothing. And I believe this process enables me to gain richness, like Felix Kulpa or disaster with happy results or mistakes. And I think clicking uh, images on Discord may not be painful enough <laughs> or like it did not contain um, enough mistakes. So well, um, what to choose also be intuitive, but seeing out and seeing outcomes is perfect. Um, but the process to reach that image so uh, that was i was thinking so uh, it will be perfect to hearing your comments on that okay yeah thanks that's great great points so intuition is an interesting one um because a lot of people are against current ai methodologies think saying that you know humans don't just um work that way you know we have intuition and i think that's kind of confusing what I is um, because or obviously there's the conscious part of ourselves and often we think that that's the part that does all the thinking um, but actually the unconscious is what does most of everything and, and we know this now it's pretty undisputed I mean it's it, it's a fact that it's there's so much happening in the brain that we aren't consciously aware of so intuition is in a way the processing that is done in the unconscious being elevated to conscious awareness as intuition. So it's still basically processing. And one of the really interesting things that I really loved about AlphaGo was um, before AlphaGo, one of the big things that was said about the game Go, obviously, was that there's, you know, more possible moves than there are um, atoms in the universe. So with a game like Go, uh, so with a game like chess, it's possible to brute force your way, for a computer to brute force its way through chess, to just do loads and loads of searches. Um, and But with Go, that's just Im completely implausible. And the really interesting thing about Go is, again, I'm not a Go player, this is just based on my reports of reading, that when an expert Go player looks at the state of the board, they can have an intuition, they can have a feel for who's winning, and they have no way of articulating why person A is in the lead over person B. And this is one of the problems for writing Go games is that there was no way of writing a heuristic, a metric that would determine who is winning at any given time, who is ahead in the game of Go. Whereas with chess, it's, it's not difficult. There's lots of heuristics where you can count the number of pieces or you can count the number of pieces with weights, like a queen has more weight than a pawn. You can just add them up. There are heuristics. And then you can say, okay, person A is more likely to win than person B. With Go, that's been impossible. And it's been said, you can't put that in a computer because it's human intuition, which allows a person to know what to do. It turns out we could 
basically programmed to learn that intuition. And that's exactly what AlphaGo did. One of the many things in AlphaGo is to be able to evaluate the state of the board game, but this evaluate the state of the board. So this is one thing that I really love about Go, AlphaGo. The way that it works is it does simulations, which are basically imagination. So it runs MCTS, Monte Carlo Tree Search, which is basically it's imagining potential futures and then evaluating through its intuition. Um, so that's what, one thing I wanted to say about uh, intuition. Regarding the second part, one thing you said, which I think is really interesting, is pain. Um, there's a lot of debate right now whether AI art, quote unquote, is real art. And by AI art, people mean just basically Dali mid journey, like they're completely erasing the entire history of AI art, but let's just go with it for a second. And the other day I saw a tweet from some CEO of a tech company. Um, and he said, those people who say AI art isn't art don't know what they're talking about. AI art is art. Look at this image. I spent a whole hour tweaking this image. This image is mine. I made this image. I spent a whole hour on this image. And I thought, wow, you spent a whole hour. Like, I've spent two years on a project. You know, you know what I mean? Like, an hour is not long um, on an artwork you know, the old painters would spend 10 years on a work. So I find it really fascinating how relative time is. Um, and I do also, I'm with you in the sense that I feel more attached to something if I've spent more time and more pain on it. Grayson Perry, uh, an artist that I really, really love, um, he, you know, turn a prize winner, I met many years ago, contemporary artist works with um, all kinds of crafts, actually, like making vases and stuff like that. But he, I really like him because he is not a conceptual art. I mean, he's, his work's very conceptual, but I remember in an interview, he once said, I'm not the kind of artist who would just be in a bathtub and have an idea and then call someone and say, hey, this is my idea. And then that's the artwork. It's like, no, I want to make something. I want to you know, I want to use my hands, I want to make something. And I think it's just a personal preference that there's room for everything. Um, there should be room for everything. The problem is when one displaces the other. If all of a sudden, all it takes is just a couple of minutes or maximum an hour, and then that displaces other forms of making, then that's not ideal. Um, but I do like to be attached to my work through time and Maybe pain is a strong word, but yeah, suffering. It's not suffering, it's joy, but. I was crying inside, but with joy. <laughs> Thank you. Can I just, well, quick question, um, Memo, then we've got the final question for the chat. Just, just a clarification. Um, I, I thought the code discussion we think through it in our unconscious was really actually incredibly thought provoking. So th thank you for that. I, I was, maybe this is a misunderstanding, but when you were talking about conscious in the very beginning and talking about big data, I was I right in in, this, in assuming that what you're suggesting is consciousness is somehow compressing everything and turning it into a model? Is that correct? Am I wrong there? Um, maybe that's an oversimplification. Um, what I was suggesting in that kind of evolutionary path is that we organisms are learning to compress the information of the outside world to be able to make to be more efficient in making decisions. So in a, in a basically like GPT-3, that example I gave with the elephant, in order to answer that question about in the real world, who would win as a weak ant or a strong elephant or, you know, versus a fancy world, to be able to answer those questions and millions like it, it can't just memorize every single possible question. It has to have an understanding of what is an ant, what is an elephant, what is a fight, what is to win, what is strong, what is weak, what is the real world, what is the fact, it, it has to have these concepts. And so it has to build these hierarchies of abstract concepts. And this is what our models are doing, our AI models are doing. And this is most definitely what our own minds are doing. So there are all these abstract concepts that are being constructed and learned and hierarchies and these rich networks of dependence between these concepts. One of the concepts that is learnt in organisms, I'm arguing, and when I put that 
essay out, it was actually a lot of people were like, what the hell? And then when Peter Godfrey Smith wrote his book, he's basically saying the exact same thing, but with far more examples. So I was very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Affirmed when I read that book. Uh, but basically the argument is that one of the things that is also learned as an abstract concept, along with elephant and um, strong and weak and fight is a self, the concept of a self, which is a model of, a thing which has goals and needs and desires and that we ourselves are a self in this world where there are other selves with goals and needs and needs and these selves are modeling each other and that's where basically consciousness emerges from so it's not just a compression of the information it's in compressing the all the observations and building these models of abstract entities and concepts one of those is a concept of self, which is, and we are also a self, and we also model other beings. And this is also what I mean by, um, does GPT-3 know that it knows what an elephant is? Probably not. Even though it knows what an elephant is, it probably doesn't have a model of itself as an entity with goals and needs and desires that is modeling an elephant and other agents who are modeling itself. Is that clearer? Yeah, no, yeah, it, it was super clear. I mean, there's a lot here to digest. I think this is kind of like, a, this is a video that I will watch many times to really try and get the most out of it because there's so much in there. There is one little small question in the chat, which maybe we could, it's either a yes or no answer or a longer one, but I don't know, maybe just briefly because it's been there for a while. Uh, um, uh, how can meaningful research topics be found in computational creation? That's actually either deep, well, it's, yeah. How can meaningful research topics be found in computational creation? So how can, it's an interesting question. I mean, what does meaningful mean in that context? Um, I mean, everyone has their own version of meaning. Um, what about objective? How could, can objective research topics be found in computational creation? I mean, Suppose when you say competition creation, that's that's very, very broad. Um, I, I once was um before this whole creative AI thing popped up many years ago, there was a workshop at a Neurips that I was part of. So Neurips is a very major air conference, and it was called constructive machine learning. And so yeah, this is again before GANs and things like that. It was just looking at machine learning used in a they didn't use the word creative they were they used the word constructive um and it was really interesting because i presented a paper there uh, mine was kind of quote unquote creative in the classical sense in the traditional sense but the other papers were like how to construct um a restaurant layout or how to do drug design so computational creation can be applied to so many different domains not just pictures and poetry but drug design architecture um traffic layouts you know you know so many things that could have quite significant contributions to the society and world particularly when it comes to like, like i said drug design um, and health issues so when you say meaningful, I mean, that's one thing. Another thing, I do believe in the importance of art. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been here. Like, this is food for the soul. Um, it, it's one thing to have a long life, but it's another thing to have and enjoy your long life and to take pleasure. And I think poetry and art and music are things that, that we need. So to me, this is all meaningful. Um, what I don't think is that productive is i'm a bit tired of is like the, the, the discussions of is the ai creative um i think it's productive in this in the sense that it can help us think and unpack what does it mean to be creative what does imagination etc but then to try and enforce binary classifications on ai is creative or not that's the bit that i don't find that creative one little story i want to share um the i forget his name uh what was it i can't remember his name but there's a japanese researcher who was um, one of the researchers who found 
the intelligence of slime molds. So slime molds can basically solve mazes. It's a single cell organism that can solve mazes. They're really intelligent. He discovered that it was in nature um, and really, it was it's really big news. And he said in an interview that he was really not a surprise, but he observed that the Western press, the Western media were mostly interested in, yes, but is it intelligent? Um, is it intelligent like us? This was all the mess Western media asked. The Japanese media who come from a culture of animism implicitly assumed that it is intelligent. They didn't question that. They just wanted to know the mechanisms through which it is able to do this. And I find that so much more productive over, yes, but is it really intelligent? Because the yes, but is it really intelligent, to me, has fear. It has the fear that comes from the Western values that we have, that we humans are above nature. We are the intelligent ones. How can a slime mold be intelligent? Whereas the Japanese culture, from what I understand, is like everything in nature is intelligent. Let's learn from this. How is it able to do this? And that, I think, is um, sums up my position on all these debates about is the AI creative? Is it intelligent? Does it understand? Does it know? Uh, less yes, no questions, more how questions. That's what I would say. Wonderful. Um, I, I almost want to mention a kind of comment in, in the chat because this is just a wonderful thoughts to record it. Uh, Alberto Gonzalez um, says, do you think we are crossing from AI to a hybrid model in which our collective intelligence has already been merged with our lives as designers without noticing that transition? I just thought that's a beautiful question or comment to, to finish with, this kind of a hybrid distributed entity. Um, uh, uh, Alberto, I should say, is, is flying back from Colombia to London and is in Miami right now in Terminal E. So this is the audience you've got today. Um, now a distributed consciousness right here. I distributed exactly. That's exactly what I was thinking. This has been such a fantastic thing. Thank you, Memo, for the, your generosity and this, the generosity of spirit and, and, and such a rich imagination. I, I think we're all the we're all the better for it, all the, also more the humble for it, because I think this is really... Um, uh, uh, set new standards. Um, I'm glad I went before you last two weeks rather than afterwards. So thank you, Memo. Oh, wonderful. This is going to be uploaded to our YouTube library, um, where we seem to be getting more and more hits, which is great. Um, Yosha Park is 161,000 uh, now, which is wonderful. So it's been it's been received and, and been disseminated and been distributed. So thank you, Memo. This is something I'm going to, going to play again and again and listen to because there is so much in it. It's like one of these kind of panforte, really condensed cakes you get in Italy, you know, really, really dense and full of wonderful ideas. Um, thank you, Memo. That's all I can say. Um, thank you for inviting me and thank you to all the questions. Really thought provoking. It also helps me um, think. So I, I, really, I really enjoyed it. Uh, so yeah, thanks again. And just a thank you also to the digital futures people behind this who've put this up and said that there's a lot of work that goes on you don't know about, but there's there. Wonderful, wonderful. Next week, we're going to be looking at AI in the design studio, maybe more straightforward, but it should be full of the wonderful provocative examples, um, that Mem, similar to what Memo showed this week, um, and, and so on. We will continue, um, and this will be out there as part of our distributed consciousness. So... Um, Thank you and see you all again next week. Um, this was really a wonderful session, Emma. Absolutely amazing. My Thank, you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.